All right, welcome friends. Hello, and really, really excited to see everybody. Some familiar faces. Uh, here we are for our first kickoff session on that Jews Marxism, um, a Marxism from a militant standpoint, a materialist reading of Alain Bajou with Gabriel Tupanamba. Uh, folks will know Gabriel in our circle um, we hosted last spring, uh, an incredible launch of his book, The Desire of Psychoanalysis, and uh, had many different Lacanian thinkers on to discuss uh, Gabriel's work there. Um, Gabriel actually has been working on Alain Bedjou's philosophy for many years. He did his PhD with Bedjou himself, along with um, Dennis, Dennis Yao, who's actually with us tonight as well. Uh, they've recently written a book which looks at Bedjou and political economy. And so, you know, I, I'm not going to say much other than there has certainly been, and I think most all of us are aware of this, I don't know, a kind of general understanding of Bedjou, especially in the Anglo-American reception of Bedjou, that um, he is a thinker that is considered a post-Marxist. He's a thinker that's considered... Um, unintelligible to questions of political economy, which obviously concern Marxism very deeply. Um, and, you know, there have been a lot of um, polemics and maybe a lot of misreadings. I mean, you know how these things work in academic uh, circles. So you sort of get a kind of stereotyped uh, vision. And I think one obvious um, uh, unfortunate fact speaking of stereotyped uh, visions of Bedjou is this notion that, well, he talks about the miracle of the event or the rarity of the event. <laughs> so I think tonight and um, these next four sessions um, will hopefully give us some grounds to, to reappraise uh, Bedjou in relationship to the Marxist orientation. Um, and I, uh, basically, I think for, for interventions, Gabriel's open to any, at any time, folks can jump in with, you know, full respect and all of that. We could also use, if you prefer, the stack method, which is a new way of um, requesting to speak where you just put the stack in the chat and your name. I found that pretty good. It's easier than having to do the emoji of the hand thing. So I would recommend we do the stack. And with that, I will turn it over to Gabriel Tupanamba to uh, take the floor. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Uh, there is like this huge party going on next to my house. So if the sound goes kind of shaky or weird, let me know. I can try to make it a, a bit less terrible. Uh, I'm really happy, at, I mean, with the turnout of people interested in, in this, these questions. I think that, uh, I mean, rather than like, preparing like a complete exposition of a of something of an argument for you guys i i'm incapable of not preparing slides so i did but actually i think that they're more like a an attempt at something so i thought of of doing this in a slightly more informal way so don't really you don't guys you guys don't need to wait for me to finish before asking questions i think there are a lot of different kind of uh, paths we could take in this conversation. I propose this very broad theme of mathematics, materialism, and so on, just to frame a conversation that I thought we could have today. And I did prepare kind of a way to conduct the conversation, but I don't think it would be a big problem if it took a different route. Uh, I'll, I'll also explain why, because I think this, there are two good reasons for this. The first is that, uh, this is a bit of an experimental thing. Uh, Daniel mentioned uh, Dennis, who is also here today, but uh, both him, Daniel, uh, Rafael, who is here as well, and others, uh, we've been involved in a common project, which requires, or, or at least was motivated. It's, I think it's a good question how, how connected it is to Badu, but definitely he's a part of it. And, we're still, at least in the part of the project that I'm involved in, and I know Dennis is also involved in, 
we're still trying to find the proper way to kind of address, present, introduce in a simple and kind of transmissible way, the way we are kind of uh, reading and approaching his work. So getting a kind of feedback from you guys of what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, as I said, being interrupted and kind of steered into what is kind of obscure is also very helpful for us to kind of get a, an idea of if this makes sense or if it doesn't. So I'm not sure if it, if it does make sense. So that's the first point. The second point, which I think also uh, warrants this being a bit more informal, which, it, which is also a bit more elusive, perhaps it might make a bit more sense after the conversation today, which is that uh, I decided to call this, this discussion of Badiou, this, this presentation, Marxism from a militant standpoint, because uh, I, I would like the kind of the, the end result of this or the, the kind of outcome of this conversation to be, the, to be something like the feeling that if you're interested in Badiou for like deeply philosophical, theoretical reasons, that there might be something new for you to do concerning how you approach politics, perhaps to give, to give this sort of uh, more engaged endpoint, a, a more consistent or more slightly more central place in understanding what Badiou is about. So the idea that if you take that into consideration, a lot of things make sense, but also uh, to show that this guy can actually furnish a lot of very concrete kind of ways of approaching some contemporary questions for those who are engaged in militant practice and so on that are quite useful, uh, not useful in the sense of telling you what to do with your political engagement, but I think that uh, it can be quite refreshing to see a lot of issues that you can face in political practice that sometimes seem very ordinary, minor, or lacking philosophical relevance to become kind of, you know, the things that set the standard for what philosophy is allowed or not allowed to do. Uh, while I was preparing this presentation, I, I slowly had this image in my mind, like forming this image in my mind that in a certain sense, there is something very Wittgenstein-like in Badiou in the sense of, you know, kind of therapeutics where I think that at the end of it, it provides a bit of a relief that if you displace questions that are formulated in the wrong places back to their proper domains of reference, that they become tractable questions. So that, I, that kind of art of finding the, the, the domain in which a question becomes tractable doesn't really sound like, the, like a, a proper Badiouian concern, right? But I think that that sort of uh, operation is actually quite central. And the fact that militant practice is actually one of those domains for otherwise very speculative and philosophically profound questions can be a bit of a relief, the sense that it gives legitimacy to some things. And also it can be a bit of a relief that perhaps you can still be interested in philosophy and pure philosophy and not really concern yourself with answering false questions. So, which I think it's also very Wittgenstein theme, right? So, uh, not, not that this doesn't mean that there's like a profound affinity between the two, perhaps that interests somebody, but I don't think that's really the point. Uh, but it does say something about the sort of approach that I think uh, I'll try to exercise today with you guys. So let me try to share my screen. I know there are many ways to do this. Let's see if this one. Uh, Make my screen bigger so you guys can see that. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Looks good. Yep. Let, just before I start, let me just see if you guys can read everything. Like, is this here within your screen? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, yeah, as I said, the idea for today, this is the first kind of meeting i try to divide these four meetings I, it's a i'm a bit torn by the, the sort of approach i decided to take because i thought of okay four 
three or four big reproaches or issues people raise when discussing Badiou and Marxism. Uh, and one of them concerns mathematics and how, how, how can this be connected to historical materialism when you have this mathematical ontology and so on. And how, how are these two things connected, if, if at all? Uh, the issue of political economy, which is like this classic issue, uh, a question that I find very interesting, but it's not that usually it's only posed when people already dismiss the guy, but it's not really theoretically posed very often, which is why are there four procedures? rather than one or three or five, which I think it's also a very interesting issue for somebody interested in Marxism. Uh, and finally, the question of subjectivity, uh, what is militancy within this project, given all the different things we're gonna be discussing, what is left, uh, what, what, what does he actually say about political militancy and things like that. So I chose these four topics, but I wouldn't like to turn this into a polemic with the authors or commentators that raise the questions. I think that they are they are common enough to people who have any minimal engagement with Badiou. Like if you're a person like, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm part of this group of people who usually chat about authors I haven't read very much, but I know like the common reproaches everyone has, you know? Like most most authors are like that for me. I just know what why I'm not supposed to like them, and I know like even this commonsensical uh, way of criticizing them that should be enough to make these points I raised relevant. You don't need to have like a profound engagement with his work. Uh, I think the gossip might be enough to to know that these are relevant issues. I also didn't plan to make this into an introduction to his system. Like um, the idea is not to slowly bit by bit construct all his main theses, the whole, you know, being an event thing and so on. Uh, I think the course will definitely be more intelligible, more interesting for people who have already read some of his work. Uh, even if you fail at it, I think it will still be like most of us would try to read being an event and are find no, meet a bit of resistance in the process. Uh, it's already enough to at least have some acquaintance with it. So even though I frame the, the classes based on these polemics, uh, I don't want to make them polemics against authors, like fine readings of their arguments and so on. I just want to use them as an excuse to provide a different reading. Sometimes that alternative reading is actually quite compatible with the critiques in the sense that they are kind of directed at a scarecrow. Therefore, you know, you just realize but you is actually in the same place as the, as the commentator who's criticizing him. Sometimes uh, I think that we might conclude that there are good reasons to critique him like that, but there is a more generous alternative approach that is more useful. So why focus on, the, on, on that particular reading, right? Uh, and sometimes I think they're correct in the sense that they are, uh, you know, verifiable in the literature, that he didn't say this, or he didn't go there, or that he has some limitation. And at those points, which I think are the most interesting ones, uh, I think we always have two, two, two choices at least, right? To either dismiss the author and say, okay, so this project is flawed, let's look for something else. Or to see if there isn't a way inside the basic framework of the project that allows us to go beyond the limitation that we found and still do something that is coherent with that project, right? So sometimes we might conclude, and I think that that's, for example, concerning the theme of political economy, I don't think it makes, it, it would be impossible to claim that, but you, you know, has a hidden fourth book of being an event called the critique of political economy or something. The, the thing doesn't exist, it wasn't done, but we could ask, is there a coherent description or construction of, you know, reconstruction of Marx concepts that is coherent or compatible with the basic premises of what Badiou is doing? So in that sense, it is a limit, but it's a limit that can be crossed or surpassed within the framework that he sets up, right? So. I would say, and we're going to go into this in a bit, but uh, as we go into the question of the day, right, is his use of mathematics incoherent with Marxist premises, that is, with general premises of historical materialism, dialectical materialism, and so on and so forth? Uh, 
one of the ways we can answer this question that is not simply trivial in the sense that, well, he doesn't mention Marx, Lenin didn't speak of mathematics, therefore it's wrong. Uh, one of the ways we can go further into that question is constantly making that distinction between, let's say, the infrastructure or the architecture of this project and what new propositions are coherent with that architecture, meaning that you can add those propositions and the rest of the building won't fall, right? And, and which propositions are, let's say, perhaps too strongly tied to the particular context of that person called the Lambadieu and his own commitment. So to make that distinction between the more structural commitments of the theory and the more personal commitments of Alain Badiou, the militant, the writer, the French man, and so on, right? Uh, you could say, oh, this is, isn't this a bit ad hoc, like the inverse of ad hominem, like some sort of ad, I don't know what's the, the how do you say, inhuman in Latin, but like some sort of, you know, in Portuguese, we have this great expression, passar pano, like when you, there is something like the press, the person is about to be canceled and then for some moral reason, and then you try to relativize their wrongs and save them from, uh, in Portuguese, that passar pano means like to, to how do you say this, Rafael? Like uh, to clean wipe, the- Wipe the moral. Yeah, wipe the moral wrongs. Yeah. So why isn't this like just an arbitrary way of saving somebody? Well, one of the reasons that we will see is that that very distinction between the infrastructure of a thought and the way that personal commitments come to, let's say, give flash to that structure, that skeleton, that's actually part of his own theory. That's a very central part of his theory to make that distinction. So uh, when we take that approach, we're not moving away from his proposals or trying to save it through some arbitrary operation. We're actually applying something that he developed himself. So my idea for today, uh, based on this, is to uh, first just make some general remarks about this sort of method, the way that I'm seeing it. I think that, I mean, there are people here who I work with constantly who might also help out spelling out a bit of these methodological presuppositions. I try just to give, the, give us some general pointers there to orient what we'll be doing afterwards. Then I just got some, I mean, I don't think, I think there are two, two really good kind of, really good authors, really good critiques of Badiou, one coming from Fabio Gironi's book, Naturalizing Badiou, and the other coming from Adrian Johnston's uh, kind of constant engagement with Badiou's work. Both of them kind of take issue with the question, why mathematics, why not natural sciences? And also why not, uh, cognitive science and why not philosophy of mathematics, contemporary philosophy of mathematics? Why are these things missing? And uh, Daniel, I'm looking at you and you seem displeased. Can you, is my sound still working? Is the connection dropping? Uh, no, you sound great, man. No, okay. it's all good. <clears throat> okay, you're displeased with something else. Then. Okay. Uh, so after after just <laughs> raising the, the, the this critique and trying to I mean, be generous with what it's trying to uh, take issue with. I'm going to try to reconstruct a, a very old theme, in fact, probably as old as Marxism itself, which is the crisis of Marxism. And I'm going to try to show you going very quickly through a couple of, you know, incompatible authors. So Karl Korsch, then Sartre, then Althusser, then Badiou himself. Uh, how uh, the lack of a certain framework was felt within Marxism or has been felt within Marxism for a very long time. And I wanna suggest that when we take this crisis into consideration, it becomes clearer what are the materialist conditions for the project of being an event. So uh, we're gonna look at, okay, there's some wrong, some pro problem, something missing or something in excess or some, something symptomatic in Marxism and something that we can keep track of throughout the 20th century in a way, though I'm doing this in a very schematic way. Uh, and we'll see how this informs very, very profoundly why being an event is the way that it is, 
right? So that's my idea. We're not going to go into like specific concepts of being an event, like go over the axioms of ZFC or, you know, whatever. But I just want to kind of, I planned at least for us to end the, the, this conversation at the kind of the entry door of being an event with more tools to know why it begins the way it does. And I think we can even make a sort of comparison with the first volume of Capital, you know, where, uh, well, we can, we can make that comparison when we get to it. But so these are, this, I think this is, this is an important point. Uh, again, as I, as I told you guys, please interrupt me at any point. Uh, I have absolutely no commitment. It's not necessary for us to arrive at the end of this thing. We're, for example, to this last point here, concerns a lot the theory of the four conditions. So we're gonna discuss it in, in some detail and schem schematically analyze it. So it's also part of the theme of next meeting. So if we don't get to cover it today and we go on a detour, it's no problem. We can just pick it up again next time. So feel free to interrupt as we go. So uh, I think we should begin with this point here. Like why the hell do we need to spend our time saying that some French fella, you know, who wrote mostly in the 20th century, very weird French theory, why should we be reading him today? And I think I, I don't want to really don't want this discourse to be like, you know, yet another one of those discussion groups where we conclude people didn't read some author well enough let's go back and read him even more. I think that uh, <laughs> that's not really what I would like to do. So I think the fundamental reason to do this, and it has to do with the political conviction of mine, so it doesn't come from philosophy, it comes from political challenge, where I think Badiou proved to be very useful in kind of framing political issues in a new way for me, which is this thesis here. You, it, you can find this thesis developed in different kind of kind of slightly different ways depending on your political affiliation but uh one one way that i like to think about it is that uh, two two versions one is the soviet version one is the contemporary peripheric brazilian version the soviet version of the question concerns i think appears very nicely in the work of alexander bogdanov Bogdanov had this kind of pre prescient kind of uh, anticipatory uh, view that he said, well, he had this hypothesis that, uh, which is not that uncommon for Marxists, that, well, the, the, the world of work comes together with a kind of a life world, not simply, uh, not simply, it changes the forms of consciousness of people. So, as the division of the technical division of labor intensifies, radicalizes, and creates more and more special, specialized forms of labor, it actually follows from that hypothesis, which is very common, the consequence that the life world of people, of workers, tends to get specialized and as distinct as their forms of labor or as a form of the small kind of fragment of the, the world of production that they are inscribed in, to the point that we cannot count on labor itself to serve as a unifying standpoint to bring together all these different fragments from the productive world. So Bogdanov was kind of concerned with this issue of, OK, the technical division of labor is going to lead to such a social fragmentation that at some point, the, the idea that there is an underlying common ground we can count on, which we call the experience of labor or the, the the working class, not as a class, but as an experience. But this experience will be shared enough and, and propagated by capital enough across the whole world that we can count on it as the ground for composing political forces. And Bogdanov thought, okay, we need the concrete positive uh, contingent theory, right? Not a, a theory of an underlying necessary structure to guarantee that there, are, there is space for kind of collecting different fronts of struggle. So, Something needs to be done for different fronts of struggle to compose together. Uh, this is not unlike a 
another contemporary thesis, which is, comes from Brazil, develops this a lot. We have some really good uh, Marxists working on this, which is called the peripherization uh, thesis. Uh, Daniel's asking if the term class struggle could be thought of as synonymous with that of class of social fragmentation. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, class struggle, I mean, you can imagine it to me. I mean, I, I think that a really good way of, a kind of slight ironic way of framing this uh, is to say that social fragmentation or what this periphery, peripherization thesis called the peripherization of the world, uh, what it implies is that antagonism within the people becomes more intense than antagonism with the enemy of the people. So it's a situation where the main struggle happens within the working class and not between the working class and capitalists. So, uh, but why is that the case, right? So peripherization thesis, I'm not gonna go into details of it, but ultimately its claim is, uh, you know, those underdeveloped countries with their very hybrid social regimes where legal and illegal uh, uh, normative structures, very advanced capitalism with kind of backward looking uh, forms of poverty and so on. Those things were that hybrid mass was supposed to be washed away by development of capitalism and kind of it, in the inclusion of these countries more and more into, uh, into the market and this more homogenized forms. Well, that hybrid social formation is actually the future, is the most advanced kind of social technology for, for you know, the new modes of capital accumulation. So it's, rather than being the remnant of a past that's not yet uh, remo uh, kind of destroyed or surpassed by capitalism, is actually the most fertile ground, most fertile form for development of contemporary capitalism. So that sort of hybrid situation where, again, you have very kind of sharp edges between social groups. Uh, you don't have such a homogenization of the working class through similar conditions of labor, some formal uh, imposition from you know working uh, conditions through law and so on. That hybrid scenario becomes the thing that expands itself towards the, another common thesis that the, the center and the periphery kind of are in a weird equilibrium where the center still exists but depends on the periphery, right? Uh, Yunus asks, why do I refer to social fragmentation? The aim is to signify that we, the working class, is not the subject of the revolution or something else. Uh, Yunus, could you, could, you, could, you, could you say a bit more about your question, perhaps? I think you're muted, though. Yeah. 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 If if you want if you want to combine with the, the idea of social fragmentation with the philosophy of Badiou, especially in the in the sense in terms of political intervention and so on, uh, I think if what do you mean? What I meant is that so uh, you want to. You want to mean so social fragmentation is a background for Badiou's philosophy or something else? So, because <clears throat> we we all know that uh, from the sixties that Europe, for example, European working class has had already been contained by the Keynesian welfare state. So th there was no revolutionary subject as the proletarian class. So there was a need as the subject of the revolution. So is that the is that social fragmentation that this specific idea refers to the idea of subject, which is which is one of the key topics for Badiou. Uh, I think I understand your question better. Yeah. No, I don't think that is the point. Uh, 
I, I totally understand now what you're saying. I think that there is a, I mean, there is a very long narrative of philosophers who start with the claim, our beloved revolutionary subject is no longer here. We need to rethink, right? That's not what I'm saying. Perhaps it would be a bit closer to the statement that perhaps philosophers shouldn't be worrying about the revolutionary subject to begin with that much. That question belongs somewhere else. The, what I'm trying to claim here, which I think it's a motivation on my part, it's not something concerning Badiou directly, it's concerning the motivation for us to read him, not the motivation of his own project, is that, well, what's a, one of the consequences? Sorry, yes, Yunus, you wanted to say something. If I frame my question more scientific way, this description or these concepts that you use, social fragmentation, is that a sociological one or political one? Which one do you want to refer? I, be, because the sociological one refers to the, 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 the change or the transformation of society or the political one, the other one, something else. That the philosopher says that we don't have any more the revolution subjects or yeah, so, I, don't, I, I, I don't know how to make that choice. My, again, perhaps I'm not being clear, but I'm not trying to say something about Badiou's philosophy yet. I'm trying to say that for me, my practice, militant practice, the idea which I find convincing from my experience that we cannot count on a given well-structured kind of already settled homogeneous background to guarantee that so a political composition of different struggles happens. I mean, the fact that common compositions must be constructed rather than simply discovered because they're already there. I find that this uh, hypothesis, which for me is a political hypothesis, but I find that it has confirmation in many sociological analysis as well. Why not? Right. This is a a reason to return to Badiou and to make actually a more productive use of something which we'll be exploring today a lot, which is his concern and the fact that he builds the whole structure of his mature system on the idea that we should, how to put this, we should embed the problem of the commons into the political sphere as a something that you do rather than allow philosophy, ontology, and other fields which, let's say, have an easier time addressing what is common to substitute and suture this problem. So this is, let's say, the underlying motivation. In a situation where the task ahead of us politically includes the construction of political composition between struggles, because this is not a given, and you can claim it's uh, yeah, I think, I think it has a lot to do with Laclau. Like, uh, one way that I would frame this if we were to discuss like different political theories is that in the sort of crisis of this revolutionary subject or of the classic way of approaching it, I think there are two big paradigms that struggled in the end of the 20th century. Negri told us that, look, yes, yes, the working class is heterogeneous, the party form is problematic, this and that, Social, social conditions are very heterogeneous, but every social resistance, insofar as it is social, every different social political struggle, insofar as it is already always cooperative, it always has the form that we need to kind of bind them together. It's of the very nature of creative, political creativity that multiple forms of resistance will glue one another and accumulate force together. So, the, let's say there is something we can count on that is coming from philosophy, from Spinoza, or God knows what, that kind of guarantees it gives us a sort of conviction that we can worry with our local struggles and the global connection kind of follows because it's kind of intrinsic to this process. It's something that's shared by Laclau, who again criticized the idea of a common guaranteed working class revolutionary political subject, but he will say, you know, every social demand, because it's a negative thing, it's a demand, 
negative plus negative always fits together. Negativity is homogeneous. So a signifier will always be capable, the right one, to glue together local demands. So either because political desire is creative and creativity is common by nature, or because social demands are negative and negativity is common because of the symbolic, because of language, both cases, we are guaranteed that something of the common is, let's say, a tendency we can count on, right? So the background I'm trying to present to you guys is one where we, there is nothing we can count on that is a guarantee that a local pro process will glue itself together with another local process. You can have situations which are very common where you have a political struggle that is a vector going in this direction, you have another going in this direction, they actually cancel each other out rather than increase their force one with the other, right? So uh, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this thesis, which I'm not trying to construct it for you guys in the most rigorous way, just trying to give you a feel for what I believe to be a good motivation to a, approach by use project is the idea that, well, if you are, if you accept the idea or if, you're, if you want to see what follows for, for political thinking of the assumption that, well, we don't know what we can, there is nothing we can a priori say that is there to guarantee the cohesion when we compose together many different political struggles. You can take that as a principle or you can associate it with this sort of intensification of this fragmented fragmentation of social conflict uh, whatever the source you want to give to this there is an interesting connection between that sort of analysis political analysis and the problem of okay how do i avoid this sort of short circuits or this kind of tendencies that facilitate through a weird detour through we will see not only through political philosophy or through Spinoza or through Lacan, but also through science, why not? Through technology or whatever, through aesthetics as well. Things that take us slightly out of the political realm in order to bypass that problem. Well, the political world, the forms of capital accumulation today of valorization and so on, they don't seem to bring about the same forms of homogenization that we could count on, at least in some parts of the world for some periods. How do we deal with that kind of head on rather than ask for the help of a different discipline to guarantee that this still exists, right? So th that's more or less my, my motivation to why I think politically, but is in a special place within the ro role of kind of late 20th century, early 21st century, philosophers, right? I'm not even going to call it a political philosophy because I think it's actually a question if that's the case. I'm not sure if this made more sense. Yunus, uh, you seemed you seemed frustrated, you seemed displeased, but I'm not sure I can <laughs> help. But please, please uh, let me know if you want to write in the comments as well something I might try to, to address your issue a bit better. Hopefully it also gets clearer as we go. Uh, then, of course, there is the issue which we can raise, which I think it's, it's relevant, though it would be interesting to stop and think about why this is the case, uh, of why you get this such, such an unbalanced or asymmetric kind of types of commentaries of bad use. Uh, yeah, I like Stephen's proposal. How to think the proletariat in today's antagonistic social conditions, conditions that divide the working class itself, yeah, I think it's something in that direction, right? And just add to, to the question how to think the proletariat, just ask the question how to think, how to politically think. Because philosophically, we can settle on some uh, definition, like Zizek has something like this. Today, the, the very conflict between parts of you know, the proletariat is itself the very form of the proletariat. Therefore, you know, like, okay, it's a philosophical statement. It's possible. So not, not, not thinking in general, but thinking in a way that has political consequence. It's a slightly different thing, I think. Uh, so perhaps another way now going through what uh, uh, 
to what Daniel's saying here, I think that this social condition is that, that I'm describing. We could, I, I'd love to actually spend a long time discussing this. I'm, I'm, I have the fear that I'm not doing justice to, to how, how we could see this peripherization thesis and how strong it is. But I, I would say it is the sort of issue that kind of justified for many what we call post-Marxism. So, oh, if this is the case, then let's move to something else. But I think it's actually what, what I'm going to try to convince you as we go along, that the same conditions that can lead us to, to call something that deals with it post-Marxism can be the same conditions that lead us to update Marxism or to ask what it means to remain a Marxist in those conditions, right? Uh, I, I, I don't agree at all. I mean, perhaps it's, this is one of those detours we could take. Daniel's saying that well, Western Marxists were dealing with this sort of fragmentation with imperialism and World War I. And no, that's definitely not what, I, what I'm saying. I don't think that this is the condition of Lenin at all. Uh, we could go into this. I think it's a really cool topic. It goes into something which is not philosophy because you know all claims of this sort usually have the form. If I believe blah, 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 then I think political practice should focus here or there. If the statements of, of this order don't have that sort of consequence, they're pretty vacuous, right? So uh, we could discuss, you know, why a diagnosis that we live in a similar time as Lenin's imperialism, what follows from that, right? And if it's confirmed or not confirmed in actual political experimentation, in my opinion, it's not confirmed, but it's a political discussion. It's not a philosophical one. So I'll just abstain from it right now before, uh, unless you guys want to go that that route, right? Uh, yeah, okay. We can we can get to this later on. Uh, anyway, so just to re re recall where where the fuck I was. Uh, yeah, so I find it, it is an interesting thing. Which it's not that easy to to. Uh, to explain why. I guess I don't want to go too much into let's see, why people read Badiou this or that way, but it's quite noticeable that we have a kind of a big chunk of commentators of Badiou who focus almost exclusively on the political side of his work, communist hypotheses, Maoism, is he a Maoist or not, uh, you know, make the critiques that there's, you know, not Marxist enough, it's lacking political economy, uh, usually, when you're focused on Padu, the political thinker, there's absolutely no mention of ma any formal demonstrations. The chapters uh, of being an event with, you know, discussions of Cohen's results or the use of category theory or whatever, none of those things really matter. I mean, you can imagine those things not existing and most of the debates would hold the same way, right? There is another chunk which superimposes with that a bit, but a different kind of bulk of commentators, which are the most of the Lacanian ones. That's why I call too much love, right? Where everyone is interested in, is the Lacanian subject the subject that Badiou is talking about? And what about the death drive? So the, the, the too much politics usually say, where is the critique of political economy? The too much love say, there is no death drive in Badiou's system. He doesn't understand Freud. He doesn't understand. I mean, you can choose your 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 psychoanalyst of, of choice. But anyway, the idea is that again is an engagement, especially with his reading of the history of modern philosophy, his engagement with Lacan, his critiques of Lacan, uh, some kind of metaphysical debates around the one, the multiple, duality, things like that. But mostly focused on the let's say, philosophical part of Lacan and how those two things fit together or don't, right? Then there is a third big chunk of commentators. I mean, there is, I didn't mention here, but there's also the Badiou versus Deleuze commentators, which is a very big part of the literature, which basically sums up to the claim that Deleuze said it better at first, but still it's a its own kind of thing. And then there is the, the, the people who engage with the mathematical side of his work, but I, don't think it's too much mathematics because there are very few texts that engage with the mathematics itself. There are many, many texts that engage with the 
affirmation that there should be mathematics in his work. So the claim mathematics is ontology is pretty much the slogan for you know, 80% of the texts that deal with science and Badiou. Uh, if, if we do get around to the end of the presentation I, I, uh, I, I prepared, uh, we'll see that we actually go back to this point because uh, there's a really interesting kind of anecdote, anecdote uh, uh, what did Andy say? I believe part of the issue, okay, I, I'm totally reading something now out of context, right? But uh, I believe part of the issue is the concrete situation of economic production or production of a class in itself is different from the political composition of a class for itself. Yes, I, I think we'll have more tools to discuss your comments later on because uh, it's already so, I mean, so entrenched, right, in a particular way of approaching uh, uh, the relation between politics and philosophy or, or Marxism and, and philosophy that I think we need a bit more of tools so I can do justice to, I think, what you're talking about. But please remind me to go back to this. Well, of course, I'm going to read the chat. Nobody's saying anything. So. Uh, uh, okay, so why is it interesting, right, that these things appear separately? You either choose to overstate, let's say, the political part, and then you pretty much disregard the other side, or you go too much in the direction of the issue of subjectivity and so on, and other issues are not no longer interesting, uh, or you go, go too much on the side of not science itself. I mean, I, I at least don't know that. Many, I know perhaps five or six texts that uh, find, take issue with some mathematical result that you mentioned or some construction that they consider poorly presented or that he didn't understand what he was doing mathematically and they criticize him for that, for it, but nothing that develops it uh, in any direction. So very rarely you find that. Actually, there are some exceptions which are quite interesting, but not that common. So mostly what, what we see is a sort of, and I, I'll, I'll tell you guys why I think this is a problem, but a sort of reversion back to the questions that philosophy of mathematics poses. Like, rather than exploring number theory and its interesting consequences, we're going to have the question, what is number? That sort of inversion, where it's a question that is motivated by mathematics, but nothing about it really requires you to be interested in mathematics at all. So what I think is the ultimate goal of this presentation is, I think, to do something that both changes our view of Badiou a bit, hopefully, but also doesn't really end up with, with us saying, OK, so Badiou is pretty much a curtain. You know, He's, he fits exactly in like Rob, the new reading of Marx, or he fits very well in the Lukaxian framework. Hopefully, it looks like we're challenging also Marxism into a direction we don't really know where it goes, right? But we know we're still within Marxism, we just don't know what we're doing. I think that's that's how I would like us to, to feel at the end of this. Like, uh, So on the one hand, I think that we'll be looking at ways of separating things that sometimes we, we see as going together. So philosophy, science, art, law, politics. So we're going to separate these things more than Marxists usually do. As Marxists, many times it seems like our our objective or what we should be doing is providing a sort of way of combining all these things or finding a standard to evaluate all these different fields from within our perspective. So, in a certain sense, that's the opposite of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking for a way to define the limits of Marxism. To to return to Althusser's uh, one of his late texts, right? But at the same time, rather than being like a humbling experience of saying, okay, so politics is, not everything is politics or Marxism only concerns this issue here, the advancement of, you know, the transformation of the class in itself to a class for itself with the purpose of abolishing bourgeois private property, uh, rather than, let's say, delimiting in, the, in a purely negative sense what Marxism is up to, on the other hand, I think that Badiou's proposal actually uh, takes Marxist ambitions and 
ties them even more firmly into, let's say, makes them even more intimate or more uh, connected to every different form of political transformation of reality, be them political or not. So it's a weird kind of predicament where in a certain sense, I think we limit some claims, but rather than the effect of this limitation uh, be a sort of weakening, it actually makes it easier to see the sort of solidarity of Marxism with every other sort of you know, rational transformation of the world. It's not very clear for now, but I think we'll get to it, hopefully. Portable Marxism, I like this. <laughs> uh, definitely less bloated. Uh, just one second, guys, before we continue. Uh, so, uh, I think that we will see actually two, uh, I mean, when we think about, okay, let's investigate in a sort of, uh, new way Badiou's work, let's investigate the relation between Badiou and Marxism. I think the two things that come to mind are, let's make a critique of his project in the sense of unearth the conditions of possibility of, you know, mathematical ontology or generic procedures. I think that there are some interesting things to be done in that direction. Uh, we'll get to them in the last meeting, especially because I think we'll be, hopefully we'll get to address the issue of, aren't there social conditions for the experience of genericity? Which I think is something Badiou doesn't deal with, but it's a very interesting topic from a kind of social economic point of view, but also kind of, uh, perhaps a bit of philosophical anthropology as well. The second, but, but I think generally that idea, which we will see with both Gironi and Mia and, and Adrian Johnson, who both claim, yeah, but what about the condition of possibility of this? How do we get the, gen, the kind of morphogenetic point of view or the genesis of appearance out of being or of subjectivity out of non-subjective material reality? Uh, that's not really the path we're gonna take. Hopefully, you guys will get to. Hopefully, it will make more sense uh, as we go along. That it's not so much that the question of uh, oh, sorry, uh, it's not so much that that the question of what are the conditions of possibility or that the questions of critically unearthing things that we took as a given or as natural, that these questions are not meaningful, but that they are mo much more meaningful when they appear within a concrete construction, either in politics or science and so on. So in a certain sense, not that Badiou is against the critical procedure, but he isn't really for the philo philosophy, uh, philosophical strategy of critique. He kind of, we'll see that, that it becomes a bit of a tool in the toolkit of practical constructions uh, rather than the condition for any future construction is to first make this kind of clean slate critique of something. Uh, I wanted to address this other thing, which I think he, he has a really nice uh, way of, of dealing with, which is the, you know, the famous materialist inversion that Marx would have accomplished with regards to Hegel and how to extract the rational kernel out of the mystic shell and things like this, which I think it's a very kind of tempting way to deal with Badiou, especially when people already claim that he's very theological, that he has this miracle dimension with the event or things like that. But I think that Badiou actually anticipated this very nicely in theory of the subject. There is a chapter I put in the bibliography called The Black Sheep of Materialism, where he makes this very schematic story of materialist and idealist tendencies and how they fight and are in conflict, but also one kind of recuperates the other. Idealism recuperates previous materialist trends and so on. And uh, he, he makes a good, good case as to why the theory of inversion is historically determined. I mean, it's connected to a kind of the moment, a, a historical moment where we were moving from the sort of uh, theological base to a sort of humanistic uh, approach to 
creativity and, 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 and it, run, it appears on its own. It's actually being built and constructed through labor. And there's actually a practical work to, to get it to these conditions. That particular moment is the moment where the idea of materialistically inverting something is like a key critical operator. You can already see the 20th century producing something else. And he quotes this, he says, well, once humanism became an, a, an ideology or an idealist project, once it no longer had traction in any concrete political project, we had a new operation, which was called displacement, which happened throughout Europe, especially in France. This idea that we now need to displace the sovereignty of the human towards the determinations of language, determinations of social structure and so on. So a new sort of materialist operation, operator emerged. And he says, this is the moment where you, we could say that the sort of paradigm of you know, the text or discourse analysis and so on, it had some materialist traction. It was criticizing ideologies based on the human and so on, uh, trying to live up to some actual, actually existing political processes and, and things that were happening. But at some point, even that, so that this kind of theory of displacement, you think you're the, the master of your own home, but you're actually determined by something that happens behind your back. The moment that this uh, structure of finding the materialist core through displacements of determinations is also recuperated in an idealist project, which becomes this idea of everything therefore is language every there's nothing outside of text there's nothing outside of signifier or whatever neither materialist inversion nor materialist displacement are operators that actually can allow us to again come uh, go away from this idealist kind of closure back towards having some foothold on novelty and i think that one of the third the names we'll see many times uh, it's, it's a proposal that uh, I think you can find it quite clearly in Badiou in some, some, some key moments, but I think that I read this Reza here. Yeah, Reza Nader is here. He's somebody who developed this in a lot of detail in his own work, and I'm currently unpublished, unfortunately unpublished uh, thesis on Badiou, which is the idea of regionalization as a new operator. What's the difference between regionalization and inverting somebody's claims and finding their materialist condition or displacing it and showing that it's actually determined elsewhere in another scene and you're, you have a false sense of, of autonomy or self-mastery? Regionalization starts from the presupposition that, okay, even if you know, we're living in a moment where nobody believes that ideas are black, material grounding or that there's anything that exists outside of their its context or whatever kind of relativistic claim you want to put forward regionalization is actually concerned with something we've already been talking about which is finding the proper domain where a claim is relevant and daniel can you can you how is what tied to over the termination the uh question i had was the um I guess I could say it like, yeah, the 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 common uh, refrain that m m Mar Marxism turned Hegel on its head or kind of inverted um, Hegelian idealism now actually takes on a different uh, logic because of the idea of displacement. And I was wondering if that uh, if you could speak a little bit more about um, this moment, is this a uh, discovery which is internal to philosophy uh is it uh, also is it tied into althusser's uh, ideas of over uh, determination yeah i think i think althusser is a really important name there if you want to i mean go into these things which is clearly althusser is you know the marxist who thought you know the critical procedure is a reading textual procedure so symptomatic readings uh looking in Freud's theory of representation for a uh, operator of overdetermination, right? So it's very much, let's say, the period where we have like the perhaps most completed form, you know, other people tried as well, like Derrida perhaps with, you know, his crazy marks with Hamlet or whatever, but usually that idea that 
You know, the paradigm to approach Marx is a textual paradigm. It's the paradigm either of reading, of, of you know, surface operations that pretend like there is a hidden meaning. And that's actually the structure of ideology. I mean, Zizek shares a lot with that paradigm through Lacan as well, why not, right? And the reason why I mentioned this is that in theory of the subject, in this chapter, the, the Black Sheep of Materialism, he says, well, that also has exhausted itself. We can't really look for the claims that the determinations are happening elsewhere. You, what you're doing is already overdetermined. You're already kind of fucked and there's nothing you can do about it or, or you're simply fighting the wrong thing, an illusion, an ideology. So, uh, that's kind of exhausted. It has become its own idealistic force that reproduces our current conditions. It's not taking us anywhere new. And he says, well, we need the thing that is left for us is a weird thing, which is a materialism of the subject. That's his kind of bold claim there. And the operator to allow for us to break with this discursive idealism towards uh, the materialism of the subject is a big question for him that will lead him all the way to logics of worlds where he's talking about the democratic materialism versus the materialist dialectic, which has a similar structure of idealist discourse theory or whatever versus you know, upholding that there's something subjective that can kind of tie together bodies and languages in new ways, right? Uh, yeah, so I don't want to go too much into that. We're going to return to this many times. Uh, but I think that this is, this is helpful just to posit why I think these are three useful tactics we'll be using and that they have more to do with this procedure than with this two more classic paradigms of, you know, do their good reading, the fine reading of the materialist displacement of discourse, or find the real conditions of possibility, you know, who are the real people behind, you know, this falsely ideal construction, like, how does this really happen in material history and so on. Uh, the propositions are that we will try to separate an underlying conceptual structure from his personal militant commitments. So, for example, we'll try to find tools to distinguish, okay, Badiou takes claims, makes claims and has some convictions that stem from his militancy as a French Maoist who claimed from within a certain practice that some things are possible, some things are in the past, right? There are limitations to that practice, which we know from real historical political experience. So do we need to abide by those limitations? Are they central to the consistency of his fundamental claims? Or, are they, or can they be separated from it? Like, in other words, can we regionalize, find the proper domain, the proper region of a referent in which those statements that he makes were legitimate, but they're perhaps no longer legitimate. So it opens up the space for new reference, new claims, which if, a conceptual structure was found, they might still be coherent with that conceptual structure, right? Not necessarily that it exhausts itself in the specific context that it was produced. Second, we want to also be able to separate the conceptual structure in the sense of, let's say, fundamental or key ideas from the stylistic constraints that tie his work to historical context. I think that this is particularly relevant when it comes to the issue of Heidegger, for example. Uh, more than once, I think, in Logics of Worlds, Badiou claims that both theory of the subject and being an event were too uh, enmeshed in a kind of uh, atmosphere where one had to either you know, speak French theory, and that meant enter into a dialogue with Heideggerians, right? Uh, or in the case of theory of the subject, that he wanted to kind of you know, beat Lacan at his own game. So there is a sort of constant issue in Badiou, which is that he, he likes to fight the fight in the enemy's territory in a certain way, or to prove he's better at it than a master or than a, you know, a rival. So you will see poetic texts about poetry that are very poetic. We'll try to be very clearly political in the, his language changes when he deals with you know, texts concerning politics and so on. So, one, on the one hand, there is the context of the different polemics he's engaged in that affects how he writes. And there is also the fact that he is a French continental philosopher, and that's already saying a lot about what you can expect from him, which means 
a lot of obscure poetic paragraphs, you know, a very weird sense of what is important and what makes a construction worthwhile and what is, you know, secondary characteristic of it. This is a philosopher who practically only quotes French people, you know, it's very contradictory. He's used in, you know, his irrelevant interlocutor for liberation movement in Africa, but at the same time, he's absolutely provincial with his own references. Like, I think the only international reference in his texts, which are not French comp music composers, poets, mathematicians, and so on, is like Cantor and Mao, you know, and Hegel. You could say, but like, philosophers are allowed to be from other places, but like actual concrete, you know, artists, uh, mathematicians, he tends to always prefer the French. So he's a very provincial fellow. Like, is his theory, therefore, totally determined by that? Can we separate it a bit from the stylistics of? his age, and I think that that's also something that helps us to move along. Uh, one, one place where this is very, very useful concerns Heidegger, as I said, but concerns also the theory of the event. Uh, there is a really good uh, in, in interview with him based on a lecture he gave at Princeton, I think in 2016, I don't know. Uh, it, it came out through Suture Press, where he says that he was very melancholic when he wrote Being an Event, uh, and he kind of regrets many of the, the decisions he made on, made on how to write the book uh, stylistically as well and so on. So uh, in a certain sense, being an event is also a bit of a mourning and melancholia about the red years in France. Uh, so you can see that there are some weird deformations or weird choices that are concerned concern his style, right? For example, I think that a lot of his aggressive position towards analytic philosophy can be placed in this historical and stylistic context and not, it's not so profound or, or much better bridges can be built. Finally, I think that this is something we won't be exploring very much today, but I think generally is a very good uh, proposition to consider, which is that ultimately the formal chapters in his main works are the ones that are open, the ones that are open to development. It's, I, I always use the image that it's like he gives you a car with the hood open like you can pick the mode you can change the motor you can try out another thing and see if it works better or not it's much much harder to do this or to develop his ideas starting from the conceptual chapters or the ones where he engaged with with history of philosophy like usually those debates don't go anywhere or you just have like infinite you know rounds of interpreting text whereas the formal chapters are actually they, they give you both statements and they play a rule of the game that he didn't invent, which is mathematics. So if you can prove something else or if you find another theorem which is interesting, you're allowed to extract consequences of it, call them by the union and there's nothing you can do about it, right? So there, it's actually quite interesting to think of it in this way. It's definitely the hardest part. I'm being by no means an expert or even uh, uh, fluent in 99% of the formal stuff he uses. I'm a, uh, how do you call this? Like a, I you know I sweat a lot over it and I'm interested in it, but definitely I'm humble about, humble enough to admit that I struggle with it. But at the same time, I can tell you from the work I've been doing with Dennis and other people that it's hard to find a more enthusiastic kind of approach then to realize that things that he never touched upon that you read in other mathematical papers and so on, not only are coherent with the general framework of his theory, but actually allow you to make new statements that you can prove to be coherent with other things he said. So not only will we see that this, if this is possible, if these two things are possible, if we can separate a kind of architecture of his project from some statements which are more personal, concern his personal militancy, his own commitments, not only does this kind of free a certain part of his theory to be fleshed out with different content, but we also have more than that. We have a part of his project that is kind of already attuned to that possibility. You can actually check and develop on top of it because he decided to play by the rules of a game that he didn't make. It's kind of available to everyone, uh, according to Rafael, who is a millionaire and has time to... <laughs> to read it uh anyway does this make sense guys before i move on
Okay, Aaron said yes, I'll, I'll take this as representing everyone in the group. Exactly. My, my, I, you know, this was the title of my postdoctorate in, in Brazil was, you know, Badiou without, without all the French stuff. Uh, I do think it's, yeah, Badiou in the tropics, it was called things, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, it is, a, I think there is a nice project of extracting a bit of that, you know, French decadence out of putting it aside, emptying it out a bit and seeing what is left. And uh, there is a, I, my impression after doing a lot of work in this direction that there is a lot of melancholia in Badiou and a similar feel uh, perhaps to his project as to the project of pe some people that he admires, people who came up with new propositions but couldn't really uphold them fully, like comfort himself. Uh, I feel like his project poses some issues that an old communist perhaps would like to see solved, not posed as open problems. So uh, I think that in, in, in some, some places his, his representation of his own project tends to be a bit more crude or less interesting than things that appear once you start poking at it. The fact that Marxist intellectual mastery declined so radically. The, what is the Marxist intellectual mastery? You mean like this general figure? Yeah, I mean, I, what, I, what I mean is that part of the um, seduction of the image of Badiou was that he was a young man on the television interviewing the master philosophers and the, the role of the intellectual had a certain thing and that was part of its romance and that's why uh, Badiou had, or maybe to some extent still has, some nostalgic um, popularization in certain academic circles which still remember the time in which the public sphere actually was one in which the Marxist master intellectual, uh, or let's just say the Marxist intellectual, had a certain, um, I don't know, you know, force within public arena, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the um, interesting dynamic to take away all of those things from him, which is, is good because that's taking away a kind of egoistic dimension, which is good. And he would, I mean, you know, but nonetheless, like it's, uh, it's, it's still, it's still something that we're, and maybe the morning melancholia thing would be a part of it. I is what I'm trying to say, but yeah, that's kind of tied into the biographical may 68 and the role of the philosopher blah 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 you know um you know yeah i i'm, I'm very yeah, happy yeah. with what you're doing with yeah, yeah well I, I think a way of posing this which is a bit uh how to say like it's it's a bit nasty in the sense that it you know what the fuck do we know about this guy like don't know anything but uh one feeling that i have like a fantasy that i have about it is that i have the impression that that's why I associated him with Wittgenstein a bit. I think that what we're looking here is that the guy who probably proposed the most humble vision of philosophy that I know of, which is weird to say, uh, but I, as a psychoanalyst, I tend to think that people who claim, you know, that they're shit usually think very highly of themselves. So people who say philosophy doesn't exist, it's impossible and so on, don't tend to be very humble. Uh, so, Considering that, as far as people who claim philosophy actually exists, it's actually a very humble proposal, his proposal. So it's actually incompatible with being recognized as, you know, a really great genius philosopher, which is something I think he really wants to be. So it's kind of, you need to choose at some point. Either perhaps you should have adopted a style that would drive home that weird weakening of the place of philosophy, concerning conditions, or you get to be, to win every debate with the, you know, public intellectuals and feel like they're very well known, translated in all languages or whatever. Like, I don't think you can have both without distorting one of them a bit, right? So perhaps trying to have his cake and also eat it, got in the way of it. Uh, I do think that Badiou is ridiculously sensitive in a tradition that Sartre perhaps was also a relevant figure very, very sensitive, not in a condescending way to how much 
the existence of France is dependent on on colonial processes and uh, he's clearly not somebody who just mentions these things for rhetorical purposes. His militancy was always connected to it. But at the same time, he has a weird attachment to the, uh, the French vibe, right? This didn't translate into a critique or a, dis uh, a displacement or a, a distancing from that sort of stylistic and kind of form of addressing a public space and so on. So it's a very strange connection. We could say that, but we can explain it away in many ways and I don't think that that's relevant, but just wanted to, to, to put that out there because yes, in many ways, I think it, it is a matter of extracting a sort of French context out of his project and seeing what is left, right? Uh, rather than going fully into it, perhaps, which I think is what some commentators do uh, to enjoy that part of his project, perhaps more than others. Uh, okay, so that all of this to, to get to this claim. So whoever opens being an event will find in the introduction or you read like a short paper about what you will find this classic statement that he supposedly makes. It's not even the simple, but anyway, the idea that mathematics is ontology. And we know if you open these big books, I told you guys that I wanted to focus on the mature works, right? That being an event trilogy, that he works with set theory, then he works with category theory, he, part of it in logics of worlds. Uh, and the question that I want us to address as a first one is, is any of this compatible in any way, you know, with premises in Marxism? Uh, is, can there be a Marxism that goes along with this decision, right? Uh, and I chose these two authors, Adrian Johnston, who is a brilliant scholar who is interested in re revisiting and kind of reconstructing dialectical materialism in, in a way that takes into consideration many of the same things as Badiou does. So recuperates a communist Marxist tradition, including, uh, uh, you know, Zizek and those references include psychoanalysis and theory of the subject, includes science, but with a focus on biology and natural science and cognitive neuroscience uh, in order to propose a new vision of dialectical materialism. And he has problems with uh, Badiou. And the other is a project that is not, I mean, perhaps not at all connected to Marxism, but it's connected to uh, uh, kind of scientific philosophy of science and a, and a philosophical critique of the same problem of mathematics and value system from the standpoint of naturalism, materialism, and kind of imminence and raises problems that are very similar to Adrian Johnston. I think Johnston is perhaps a more direct interlocutor for what we're going to be discussing. Uh, but in a more, we find the same issues in Gironi's book in a more caricatural way, because they're not so, uh, as we will see, I mean, Gironi says it very, very clearly that, I don't think I have this quote here, but he says it very clearly, if you guys read the conclusion of his book, that he doesn't think politics should inform ontology or political commitment shouldn't, ethical political commitment that he's, as he says, shouldn't have such a strong function, such a strong condition. And actually, you know, if, if we are sure to have the best worldview based on uh, the most contemporary ideas from natural sciences, we're bound to have a better kind of to, to toolkit for politics afterwards. So it's not really enmeshed in this sort of uh, Marxist conundrum or enigma of how to relate philosophy, politics, and science, as perhaps Adrian Johnston is. But uh, I think in a certain sense, it's more extreme the way that he criticizes but you so it's perhaps easier to address as well to understand so ju just got some quotes from johnson just so we can uh start the discussion uh this is from two texts from the same book called uh prolegomena to any future materialism part one and this one is from the first text which is called what matters in ontology the head event and materialism split from within and johnston goes through, I mean, very detailed critique, but this is a place where he summarizes his three big kind of problems with Badiou. He says, 
uh, I will not only explain the position of Badiou with regards to Kant's transcendental idealism, I will put forward three far from significant problems with his reaction against Kant, right? Uh, Badiou generally has a very poor opinion of Kant and the distinction between phenomena and noumena and calls Kant the first philosophy professor and uh, has a very kind of poor opinion of Kant overall, even though he engages with Kant in uh, logics of worlds. I think that that's where he has the most detailed engagement. But so the first point is that he says that Badiou uses the concept of subject uh, when he's talking with Kant in an equivocal way. So he accuses Badiou of uh, distorting Kant's ideas and sometimes comparing Kant's problems of transcendental constitution of reality with his own concept of a more engaged, active theory of the subject. And while these two things are speaking of different things, you don't need to solve both things at the same time. You can address the question of how is reality transcendentally constituted for a subject in one place, and how, do novelty, how is novelty produced subjectively in another place. You don't need both things to be the same theory. Uh, secondly, his anti-naturalism, so his curt rejection of life sciences, as being uninteresting, interferes with him being able to account for the genesis of appearances out of being in a materialist rather than idealist fashion. So here he's talking about logics of world, especially, which is his book on the theory of appearance. And uh, there's nothing or almost nothing in the book about how is it that appearances come to appear? How is that being gets split between being and appearing, which is like a classic Hegelian theme, and in a certain way mirrors in the side of Hegel the problem of the transcendental constitution of the world, right? How is it possible that from meaningless, indifferent stuff, something constitutes itself as an object, right? And for him, the answer that Badiou gives in Logics of Worlds is not uh, sufficient. To the point that there is actually in existence. Uh, and finally, there is this critique that he makes, which I think in a certain sense goes, is the most, uh, I mean, it's the most kind of uh, ridiculous one, but at the same time, it's, it's helpful because of that, which is the question of, well, but you talks about count for one of situations. Situations are count, counted as one. Who does the counting? Isn't this something that requires us to assume that there is a hidden subject who's unifying the world? And again, the counting issue come back. So that's a big issue that it has with Badiou. How is he accounting for the existence of situations, the existence of worlds, without presupposing something that operates this unification, something that operates the, the movement from being towards appearance? Doesn't this require, in a Zizekian way, to assume that being is already split from within and therefore conflictual with itself, therefore it comes out of itself and appears to itself? You know, all the the stuff from the dialectic of uh, the doctrine of essence in science of logic. Uh, and then in the second text, which you see also deals with Kant, it's his favorite topic when dealing with Badiou, uh, he talks about, actually, I didn't add this here, I should have. Uh, he, after making these three critiques, he says, well, we have the means today to answer these critiques uh, through neuroscience. And neuroscience is concerned with how meat can start to think and how something which is non-subjective purely material in different reality can come to appear to itself so we should be looking for answers to this question it's not in mathematics not on all of this but in neuroscience and and the fact that we're starting to see that there's a lot of nice resonances between lacan and the most recent developments in neuroscience as Katharine Malabu shows very nice. Uh, so that's kind of his first critique, right? I'll get back to it later if, if it's confusing it, the way I'm presenting here. Uh, so in, in his other text, which is like one follows directly after the other, he says, well, I'm critiquing Badiou, uh, his strictly mathematical ontology, uh, but I'm striving to use this, to have the same hope, like I'm trusting the same thing, is the same impetus, that is making me go towards a materialist ontology in relation to the natural rather than formal sciences. And I'll try to show to you guys that 
the fact that he writes the same hope here is precisely what we're going to kind of look into. It cannot be the same hope because he's doing something totally different when he moves from one thing to the other. So it, it, it will tell us something important. Uh, okay, so I, I, that, this is just the points I wanted to make here. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize them afterwards. I'll just go quickly so we have time to deal with other stuff. Again, if you guys feel like it's confusing, just say stuff in the chat. I'm, I'm reading it there as well. So this is Fabio Gironi in the conclusion of his book, Naturalizing But You. You see that there's a similar kind of vibe, right? Let's look at natural sciences. What about Kant? What about the transcendental constitution of reality? And then this is Gironi in the start of his conclusion, right? He says, well, I propose a reconstruction of Badiou's mathematical ontological project. Uh, I identified its most glaring issue from the standpoint of naturalism, the lack of a proper account of the way in which ontological set theoretical situations come to have a relation with or an effect upon non-ontological empirical ones. I didn't add uh, in Johnston's quote there, but uh, uh, Johnston makes a very similar claim. He says, well, but you ultimately is like a Heideggerian. His mathematical stuff is like the basis to think ontology, and he can never really jump towards the ontic material reality he needs to have that duality, and that's a problem. And it's a critique that Zizek also makes. Uh, we will go to Zizek when we talk about the theory of the subject and Badiou, and if it's, who is the most Marxist, Zizek or Badiou, Lacan or Badiou, let's, <laughs> we'll see it the last meeting. So he says, well, we cannot account within Badiou's system for the way that ontology deals with the empirical, right? How we move from one to the other. Uh, bereft of clear empirical purchase, but use ontology can function at best as an analogical model for his ideal kind of militant political practice. So it has no empirical purchase. It becomes like a theory of what militancy ought to be. This is another thing that we're going to see that really shows that there's a very strange understanding of what Badiou is trying to do. Gironi con con continues, he says, I argue that Badiou's rationalist understanding of mathematics as founded on the pure laws of thought uh, is questionable uh, outcome of his equation of being in thought. Uh, so he proposes something else. He will show, for example, that we could be looking at a lot of interesting cognitive science or philosophy of mathematics to ask the question of how uh, uh, how is mathematics, how does it appear, how is it possible that mathematical knowledge exists in the classical philosophy, question of philosophy of mathematics as well. Uh, I feel like John is about to say something with his book. No, he's not. I thought you were like finding a quote, John. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I was just looking at the back of his book about um, his. Please uh, do, guys. Like, I, I didn't have anything to say. I just it, you, you had me thinking about one of the things he put at the end of being an event about reconstructing a history of philosophy. No worries. Thing. Sorry, man. Like, I saw it. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing me, there. Sorry, man. I totally caught you off guard there. You were like. Just in your moment, and I, yeah, sorry, it was a bit of a terrorist move, I'm, I apologize. Uh, so then Gironi continues, he says, the quandary of the applicability of mathematics to the physical world can be giving other more empirically grounded explanations. So he, he's, uh, again, mathematics has this weird idealist kind of autonomous place in Badiou's system. We want to ground it. We want to find the conditions of possibility of apl applying mathematics to the physical world, right? He will, give us some ideas about this. Uh, then he says that uh, his own proposal is to construct a structuralist view of mathematical entities that reject the difference between concrete and abstract, pr proposing a thoroughly manifest and scale relative ontology of structures all the way down. Uh, so he's pitting his own structuralist ontology versus by the use mathematical ontology. Uh, and his ontology does away with the depth necessary for Badiou's and Heidegger, see Heidegger appears again, project of fundamental ontology. I know that right now Reza is probably having a, a, a fit because he wrote like 300 pages of why this is nowhere in Badiou, but so we don't, we can dismiss the fundamental ontology that Badiou has following Heidegger and uh, recast Badiou's theory of truth 
now as a theory of a ration, rationally and computationally accountable process of abductive discovery. So <laughs> yeah, see, Rez is very good stuff. So pretty much out with the Mao Tse Tung, out with Lacan, in with Brandom, in with Bayesian probability distributions or whatever. Uh, so he says, well, but what do I mean when I say naturalist reckoning with Badiou? I mean that I'm committed as a naturalist to ontological and methodological immanence. Ontological immanence commits us to defending the continuous nature of reality, wherein all relations pertaining to what is real are always internal relations, never relations to something external, be them theistic creations, platonic participation, or any other form of vertical metaphysical dependence. There's nothing outside, beyond, against, or before what there is. So, uh, this is how I summarize, I mean, not all of the stuff I wanted to bring to you guys is actually in those quotes. I just want to give you like a feel. The, the books and relevant bibliography is available in that folder I gave you, but just summarizing a bit of the critiques you'll find there, mixing both Gironi and, and Adrian Johnston, right? Well, first thing we saw with, with Johnson, he'll say, well, but you has a theory of situations developed through this axiomatic, set theoretic approach. It cannot account for the genesis of appearance from being, or as uh, Johnson also claims, it cannot account for how inconsistent multiplicity gets to be counted as one into a situation which is then a consistent multiplicity. Who is counting? What is the process of individuation, right? So the Lusins will say, off with Badiou's mathematics, let's do some Simondon instead, individuation processes from the pre-individual towards the individual. Uh, Lacanians will claim the Hegel, you know, has a theory of how inconsistent being itself begets its other, which is the consistent, consistent kind of relative consistency of appearance. Uh, in any, any case, it's not the path that Badiou is proposing, it's not the correct one, right? Gironi makes a different claim. It would be interesting perhaps to compare them because they're not exactly the same. He's definitely not like a, I don't know what we want to call Johnston, like a post Zizekian dialectical materialist. He says, he says, a philosopher of science interested in like materialism, naturalism as a kind of broad, more robust kind of worldview or philosophical standpoint. So he, he frames it differently. He says, by new theory of situations cannot account for how we move from ontology to empirical situations. I find that Gironi's arguments are good for I mean, I think good Marxists could make these claims that he makes as well. I mean, even though he's not that interested in making political claims, I imagine he would side with more like a neo-rationalist account of, you know, politics. Politics is like reason knowing itself, some kind of uh, quasi-Hegelian account of, you know, reason. Uh, but either way, I think it's still a relevant kind of, you know, on the one hand, you have this I want a genesis of what, what must being be if it splits into appearance, which is a very classic Zizekian sort of question with Johnson. On the other hand, okay, you have this general theory of situations. How do I move? What are its consequences? How is it the, this kind of abstract general claim connected to empirical situations, right? It's a more empiricist kind of approach, perhaps. Both of them will say that his ontologies remain trapped in a duality between ontological and ontic. If you cannot move from one to the other, if one doesn't lead to the other, because you have a duality, basically you're Heidegger. You're, something is like being, it's the source of you know, novelty, creativity, undetermination, infinity, and the other is transcendentally constituted, localized, already for us. And the issue is how we move from one to the other. Heidegger would presuppose the duality and then benefit from the intersection between these two things he himself posed, right? Uh, it would be like say, the underlying core of irrationalism that we could always benefit from. Uh, just to hint at Daniel's favorite topic of the moment. <laughs> uh, third, uh, Third problem. Which no, but, I, but uh, sorry, it is. I, it is I, I regret having said that. No, 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 no. But but it is interesting the overlap of the um, of this dualistic thing because it traps him both in a Heideggerian problematic, but also it's also the basis of why he's um, criticized as a neo-Kantian by some of these people. Is it 
is it not? Like it, it, it's it's almost like once he becomes Heideggerian, he also becomes Kantian or something. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's the sort of thing that uh, he, he 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 managed to displease everyone. Like some people think he's too Heideggerian, other people think he's too mathy and formal and rash, rash, like he's trying to deduce political practice and freedom through numbers, you know? So he's, he's accused from many, many sides at once. Uh, yeah, but I, but I see your point, like the, the claims regarding hiding, I mean, it's, there's kind of an open field of pick your, your dualist of preference, right? Uh, it's interesting because being an event starts with the claim, okay, we need to do something other than Heidegger and we're failing at it. Uh, the manifesto for philosophy is also going the same direction. Uh, so why is he a Heideggerian? It's, a, it's an interesting issue. And the other is that we need to do something other than Kant, but then again, he's the Kantian one, the closeted Kantian one. Uh, part of the reasons, in my opinion, it has nothing to do with Badiou, it's simply that our philosophical, uh, you know, I mean, it's actually a Heideggerian saying, if you think about it. In Portuguese, we have this saying that says, for people who have a hammer, everything is a nail. Like, if you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, so I think that for people like us today, with the struggles that we have in philosophy, everything looks like a Heideggerian or a Kantian in you. If, the, if it looks like a Kantian, you do the Zizek operation of Hegelianizing the limits that are actually, actually objective. If it looks like Heideggerian, you criticize the irrationalist, nostalgic, fascist underlying core of it and open, you know, and praise the rationalist, blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't really matter who you're talking to. You can always throw these things at people. So uh, I think by you, in those sense, perhaps the critiques come a bit from, from this more general uh, way of criticizing him. So but I just don't want to spend too much time on it just so we can move along. Uh, we can go back to it if you guys want. I don't think it's that that crucial, really. Uh, so another point that we saw with Johnson is okay. Uh, even the idea of ontological situations, or you know, this move from inconsistent multiplicity to consistent multiplicity, or from being to worlds, what is individuating these worlds? What is guaranteeing their consistency? We could turn this very easily into a question, which I think is what Adrian Johnson is trying to do. Is what are the material conditions of possibility for this, right? There is also the idealist version of this question, which is the Maya Su question. Like, oh, you, you talk about worlds. That's, let's say, the genesis of one world. But do you need the archigenesis of worldness as such? Uh, so there, behind every kind of for example, behind the theory of the problem of events, there are the RT events, which are the birth of the condition of possibilities of the events in general, right? So there's also the Maya Su kind of version of the same question of where, where are the genetic arguments? Where is the, the history of being, right? The history of, you know, does it need to be a, a, a history of the concept, uh, but also a history of, in the sense of the, temporal process or the, the steps towards development, right? Uh, how can it be so immobile might be one, one way of putting it. Uh, one thing we find in Gironi that has to do with this, which I find an interesting way of phrasing it is that he says, you know, this whole thing with the count as one and the void, actually it has very strong theological undertones because it, but you directly claims that the void has no existence that the only affirmative claims that Zermelo Franco plus the axiom of choice axiomatic system makes, the only things that it claims to exist are things that cannot exist in reality, which are the void and infinity. So it, it has an otherworldly commitment to begin with. So he, Gironi will claim first that, look, it's very interesting in the sense that it removes us from sense certainty, removes us from intuition, from you know, the manifest image of the world, but it throws us at something otherworldly. It goes too far. It doesn't stop at science. It goes with mathematics towards a kind of too abstract field where we can't then go come back. And he makes a similar claim when he talks about the event, which is, I mean, probably the most common critique that people make about you, that 
well, no wonder that his a theory of events has such a theological undertone or flavor to it. it. Seems like this outside that he created then comes back. And that's what interrupts the situation. It's coming from nowhere. It's bringing the unexpected, the contingent. So, well, why not compare him to Heidegger after all, right? Uh, then the last two claims I think we can, we can take from reading both Johnson and Gironi is that, well, what happens with this overestimation of mathematics, uh, this kind of preference for this abstract set theoretic approach is that everything that is not pure mathematics sounds like a cop-out. It's not, it's not scientific enough to serve as the basis for ontology or for ontological claims. So, but you will say, well, if it's not mathematized, it's not science. And ultimately the only fully mathematized thing is mathematics itself. So mathematics is the only thing that really lives up to this kind of standard. So physics still has its own problems. Then biology is very poorly mathematized. And then neuroscience is just a bag of tricks as about you will claim. So he ends up debasing the value of either non-mathematized or only half or quasi-mathematized natural sciences. Uh, for Johnson, this is a big problem because for him, the, the strongest al alliance that Marxism needs to make with science comes from the life sciences and the neurosciences. So uh, that's a very, very uh, uh, problematic standard for him, right? That mathematics should have the principal place. Uh, and as we saw with Gironi, when he says that the applicability of mathematics can be explained through new ideas in philosophy of science, he's incapable of explaining real world efficacy. So uh, sure, mathematics, theory of situations, talks about, you know, it's discourse of being for being, but how is it that mathematics got to be effective to begin with? Saying that it's because uh, it touches on being seems like a detour that explains things too quickly. Right. Uh, as I said, honestly, I think you can find a quote in Badiou that justifies every one of these claims, especially early being an event, uh, writing where he's so strongly trying to polemicize with Heideggerians. He sent the book to, you know, a lot of different French intellectuals trying to get their opinions. And like Lyotard was an inter uh, interlocutor. Uh, he, he, he claims in the English edition of being an event, he knew this book would stay as a classic, like a very important book, uh, but it's clearly meant to be read by specific people in a specific place. Uh, it might be unconscious in the sense that he's not aware that he's doing this, but there's definitely a heavy hand that facilitates, uh, you know, it being placed inside a debate. Uh, People who read, for example, his book on the letters, I think, get the feeling that he wanted to be, you know, sharing the spotlight with, you know, Deleuze and other French thinkers. Uh, so I do think that we can find uh, quotes or citations that that justify some of these claims, perhaps all of them in a certain sense. But as I said, we're not going to try to refute these things through. Uh, close readings of the details of Badiou. I think there are two lines of argumentation that we can take. Uh, one is, as I said, well, let's provide an alternative account of what, what mathematical ontology actually is. In which sense is it not uh, idealistic? In which sense is it not, you know, like, I don't know, some of these claims are wrong. Yes, I think that's necessary. It's interesting. We're going to do that in a way. But I think that it cannot be done it's impossible to actually diffuse this polemic and point towards a more productive use within Marxism of his approach without doing the second thing, which is understanding the expectations and the underlying philosophical strategies that motivate this sort of critique. A lot of things that we don't find in Badiou are not really meant to be there. It's on, on, from his standpoint, I think. The question is, why do we expect them to be there? Right. This is what ties us back to that first point I made about why I think that this, you know, deepening of social contradictions within the left, within the working class, the, the more we cannot trust that there is a homogeneous background to guarantee uh, 
uh, we know how to, let's say, if there is no concrete political movement we can latch onto, we can engage with, at least we know, like with Jean-Luc Nancy, that being, it's, being in itself is already common. So if there is no place for communists on earth, there is place for communists in ontology, you know? Uh, if you wanted to totally empty this out, uh, it's not easy. And I, I think that having this idea in mind actually helps to explain why we start asking so much of philosophy, right? Both ask it to explain the political horrors of the 20th century, as Badiou claims in Manifesto of Philosophy, that people spend a long time using philosophy to justify, you know, fascism or Nazism. It should, philosophy should live up to that question and answer it and protect us from it in some sense. But I think you can also have the other way around, which is that philosophy and political philosophy solve political problems, right? And I think that that's just precisely what Badiou's project manages not to do. Uh, so in a certain sense, there are clarifications we can do that help perhaps diffuse some of these claims by just looking at Badiou's project. But some of these claims are not being simply misread in his project because of what he wrote. They're simply expectations we have of philosophy and ontology and whatever. Uh, I, Daniel, your, your question is very sophisticated. I don't want to... Should I, I like that now the social fragmentation thesis makes the question of philosophy return in this crisis, but then overall, but you weakens the role of philosophy to respond to it. Yes, I think that's exactly it. Weirdly enough, uh, it's, I think that's a good way of putting it. Like it's weird enough that the guy will kind of help arm us against putting our hopes in the wrong place. Right, uh, but not necessarily by producing a philosophical solution, but by showing that philosophy doesn't have the tools, and it's a good thing that it doesn't to solve these problems. Right, uh, so it's a weird kind of uh, it's a weird kind of strategy. I'm not sure how conscious it is, uh, but but I think that's part of what we will be looking into. Yeah, Reza said, philosophy provides a space for the answer to be found, but does not provide the answer. I think that's a really good summary of it, right? And, and it's very different from saying that it has nothing to do, right? That's also why I mentioned the Wittgenstein connection, like kind of wants to clear the ground for something that it cannot do, but the tendency is for us to always expect it to do, right? It's, I, I think also, I mean, not, you don't need Wittgenstein, you can think about Lacan here, like a bit of an analytic thing where Ultimately, it's, a, it's more about weakening the other, you know, that you tend to suppose to be able to solve something. And once that other is kind of diffused or emptied out a bit, it becomes easier to formulate the task or the problem in a way that you can actually deal with it. So that sort of trade-off between weakening an other who's supposed to know the solution being connected with opening the space to actually practically engage with a problem, you know? That's actually a very analytic kind of thing. And I think that Badiou in general does generalize, does kind of take the analytic intuition very far into, into a, more, a broader theory and finds very nice kind of uses of, of that insight elsewhere, you know? Uh, I, I prepared something that I'm not gonna do just so we don't don't waste too much time. I just wanted to go into something else before we, we close up. So I, I had a bunch of slides here with like Korsh talking about the crisis of Marxism in I don't know, 1923 or something uh, and how Marxism is getting stale and uh, becoming a sort of uh, what he calls like a general systematic sociology. And he makes, tries to show that, you know, just because we have this sort of uh, What does Badiou thought offer for thinking? Nothing, uh, Stephen, sorry. I don't think Badiou offers. But wasn't this, your, wasn't this your initial thought that Badiou does offer us something for thinking about political constitution in a period of social antagonism? 
No, I think that Badiou probably helps us to understand how far philosophy can go in these things. And after that limit, you should be probably looking somewhere else for it. Uh, it's definitely not a matter of proposing an alternative answer to the same problem, but I think rephrasing the problem in a way that includes philosophy in the problem, let's say. Uh, I just wanted to point this out because, I mean, this is a general, a very general history I wanted to go over. I don't need to go in detail. I can send you guys the, the slides afterwards. You can read it if you want. But just going through authors that don't really go well together, like Korsh is you know, introducing us to what will be like Western Marxism, Frankfurt School kind of approach, discussing Marxism and philosophy. And he's pointing out that there is a weird problem behind applying Marxism or Marxist ideas to new political situations. And how do we solve that issue of, you know, a sort of exhaustion of certain ideas once a new situation appears? Ideas that were born in a novel context, like Marx, uh, 1848, First International, all of a sudden, they become stale, they, they change their function and they start becoming like preconceived models that we apply to new things and we learn nothing from the new things. And when Sartre is writing the introduction to the critique of dialectical reason, and talking about the relation between existentialism and Marxism, he again goes over this idea that, you know, Marxism today simplify data, conceptualize the event before studying the events. They don't learn anything from existence itself. They only want to learn from reading Marx and then applying it to reality. And we don't have a theory of how to keep Marxism, let's say, porous to novelty. And existentialism was meant to help with that, right? Alto, Sarah coming from a totally different place saying similar things, right? Uh, we need the materialist dialectic as the sole method that can anticipate the theoretical practice by drawing up its formal conditions. In this case, we use, use theory not as a matter of applying formula to pre-existing content, right? So if you read this quote in general, you'll see that what he calls the materialist dialectic is this sort of general theory of how specific theories can be born out of specific practices. And the big problem of this materialist dialectic is, okay, how can I create a theory about how novelty can reinvent things without predetermining what novelty looks like? So it's very curious that it's actually a very similar issue that Sartre, his nemesis, was dealing with, and many people before them. We want, we know Marxism is born out of a specific historical context. Uh, we know that in some sense that specific historical context is, tends to be very long, therefore Marxism applies to this whole period. But at the same time, there are specificities, singularities, not only in the field of, you know, class composition, political struggle, but also, let's say, as he puts here, uh, I don't know if he says like epistemology, history of science, history of ideology, philosophy, art. We're also expanding kind of synchronously the reaches of Marxism. And suddenly we find that we are applying preconceived formula. We're no longer learning from reality. And how do we kind of fix our theory so that it is, let's say, the, it is very grammar, porous to novelty rather than let's say something we constantly need to come up with an concepts based in political experience these concepts become sort of doctrine this doctrine is applied to a new situation which doesn't fit that old experience now the two things are in contradiction and then you know we dismiss one of the two uh, is there another way of dealing with this and I, what I find interesting, both Korsh, Sartre, and also Sartre, that they all think this is a theoretical problem. It's not something opportunistic, revisionistic, in a purely moral or political sense. They think it's something lacking that requires a new development within Marxism. So, but Hugo has his own take on this. In 1988, he continues in the same vein. He says that uh, the crisis of Marxism that he saw in his period, remember this text, that can politics be thought was written like a couple of uh, uh, years before being an event. And he says a singular force of Marxism uh, is the evidence of its historical reference, right? He says, 
uh, well, we can say that Marxism is a universal thinking of revolution. That's not really what's fundamental, uh, or it's an analytic capacity. Uh, it's not even that it's prescribed or authorized political commitment, because you can have political commitment without Marxism as well. No, among all the revolutionary doctrines issued in the 19th century, that which designated the singularity of Marxism was the historically attested and presented itself as a revolutionary political doctrine that was, if not historically confirmed, at least historically active. It has historical credit, guaranteed, uh, which guaranteed that Marxist politics remained adequate to its founding mobility. And for him, this reference is the things that enter into a crisis. Uh, and he, he, he gives us three references, workers' movements, national liberation struggles, and socialist states. The existence of these things were, let's say, the reference that gave credence to what Marxism was saying, its doctrine. The moment that, the, not the doctrine went stale, but the reference in reality disappeared or in, went into a new kind of conjuncture, then those ideas, those concepts, they become uh, empty, like mere phrases, as Marx says in German ideology, right? Talking about left Hegelians and the sort of phraseology of uh, leftist uh, uh, philosophers, right? Uh, so he says that the, we call crisis of Marxism the step-by-step -step collapse of this framework of references. Uh, and the book, I mean, again, this is what happens all the time. You will see Badiou proposing a solution and my impression is that both theory of the subject, which tries to address this in a certain way, both can politics be thought where he will talk about, uh, introduce the idea of a subtractive method. Uh, both of them are, and being an event in a certain way, are all attempts to do something about this. But what I'll try to convince you guys that we get the most Marxist badiou when we get the least politically, directly political badiou, weirdly enough. Uh, at least the Badiou that can actually address this critique, this crisis, right? So we can, I, I didn't add that many quotes from this book, even though this whole chapter is very interesting in this topic, but I just made like a little, little drawing to help us move through his argument, right? Uh, you see that the argument behind this theory of the crisis of reference actually anticipates most of the ideas of being an event just by trying to address it. So let's say we have a certain situation, right? We can say that we have some sort of discourse or a set of ideas or representations that go along with the situation. Uh, what Badiou is saying is that, well, generally political processes, they will develop things in a direction that from the standpoint of, you know, what we consider to be the given, the natural, the way things are, there's nothing happening there. There's nothing, no difference is discernible in this novelty. We will say students are just trying to get attention. We know how teenagers are. We'll say, well, people are rebelling because you know, when people are in poverty, they just get really angry. Nothing is really going on. It's not that we cannot speak of it. We just cannot say what's the specific difference of what's happening. Right? It's not that it's unnameable in the setting before me. I have no name for it. On the contrary, of course we have names for it, but not no name that is singular for it. It's just yet another of those things, right? Uh, this is where, for Badiou, Marxism was different. For him, the Marxist doctrine actually through development of workers' movements, new socialist states, different you know fronts of national liberation struggles, and so on. It it is actually infused by these developments, it has names, singular names for it, because it was born out of those processes. So in contrast to regular political representation, or red, red, uh, regular understanding of what happens, Marxism was actually born, right? There's an arrow here coming from within this novelty, and it infused Marxism with the capacity to discern things that other ways of representing reality couldn't discern. Right. So, for example, where somebody might see angry people smashing windows, Marxists could see that there is something singular happening there. These people are doing something. They're not just angry. This could, could go somewhere. Something is happening that concerns a specific situation. It's these people rather than those people because of some reason. So that's what I think he meant, means by 
it could lay claims to history in the sense that it, it had reference. When it says something about these processes, it touched on them. It could discern something singular about what happens here, right? Well, but when, so it's not a matter of saying that Marx's doctrine was destroyed, was perturbed or deformed. It's actually that, well, the workers' movement is in crisis. Socialist states, well, are a, a mess. They don't exist pretty much. National liberation wars turned for the worst in many places, or at least are not reality in any consistent way. So once these things are no longer there, we have now concepts in Marxism with no reference. It's not that the concepts were destroyed by propaganda. They are there, but they don't refer to anything. It's weird because we are used to thinking about you as this French guy uh, who talks about truth as process, truth as you know inconsistency or whatever, and he comes at us with, you know, you're not talking about anything real. <laughs> like that's in a certain sense his theory of truth as well. Like very vulgar. Like okay, is there anything? Is there any domain, referential domain to which your concepts refer to or not? Can you discern something in reality or can you not, not do it? And he's claiming that Marxism goes into, becomes a phraseological kind of discourse, not unlike other political discourses, that are, is incapable of recognizing the novelty of things that are happening and saying, okay, this is something new. This is something worth looking at. This makes a difference because it becomes, again, incapable of discerning those things and instead covers them up with co concepts without reference. Is this like post-Marxism, uh, uh, is it, is it post-Marxism's time then? No, because Badiou is not happy enough criticizing Marxists. He also criticizes political philosophy in general. He says, what happens is that political philosophy, modern French political philosophy at least, which is what he was writing against, it's born out of turning this problem into a virtue. It says, ah, concepts have no reference. Then Laclau says, great, because if the concept has no reference, then it can apply everywhere. You know, <laughs> so you get like the theory of the political, which is voided by nature. This is a good thing, guys. We shouldn't want to refer to anything after all. So he's both against the idea that our current concepts have reference. They might lose their reference because historical reality changes. And he's against the philosophical turning of this into a virtue, which says, yes, we should be looking into the metaphysical dimension of politics. We should be looking into the very definition of justice, right? Rather than keeping track or keeping up with historical times. So he will say that, well, what's happening now is that Marxism is incapable of learning from real experiments. I forgot to add that quote. It's a good quote from, from Can Politics Be Thought? Right, so what, what he's claiming, which is not directly the way he phrases it, but I think it's a really good way of approaching it, saying, well, if this was possible, right, that means that it is true, if Marxism took place, we can conceive, it is conceivable, that political practice, political organization is capable of modeling its novelty, its own novelty, meaning if it was possible from the workers' movement in the 19th century of, for Marxism to be born as a doctrine that this is able to see the difference in many, many different situations out of a concrete political experiment, then it's possible that this happens again, right? We need a theory of how this can take place. We cannot trust philosophy to simply turn the lack of real reference of politics into a virtue we need a theory of how uh, situations and these reference themselves can model or produce new representations of the world, right? This little drawing here is a really good drawing of what Badiou calls the situation, the state of the situation, the generic extension of the situation and the subject language of the situation. So this is pretty much if every one of these scholars actually has a correspondent concept in being an event, right? So uh, if you guys are okay with going a bit over time, I'm not sure how you guys are feeling. I mean, this is a lot of stuff. I feel, I feel like we just started. This now, now it's just getting, getting... Now it's the good part, right? Now it's just getting warmed up, baby. Oh my this God. Is, this is amazing. The pancake view, exactly. This is, <laughs> 
the, uh, that is that is we we have a tradition of trying to interpret Badiou with culinary references so it's, it's skipping on with the tradition uh so yes the pancake version you can have here you know three layers or you can have like one layer with some new topping perhaps i don't know uh but i mean i for 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 those who looked into the bibliography i sent uh having this whole thing in mind will help you a lot understanding why the hell this guy stopped in 1968 to talk about concept of model during May 68. It's exactly this connection. Could, well, if... Yes, Daniel? Could you go back to the, the one before? So, so the... Where would you fit your first proposition of social fragmentation into this uh, wonderful... Uh, display that we have here? Uh, I would fit, fit it, and I'll, I'll even draw it to you. I'm just trying to, because I'm also, I'm also thinking of something for me that really helped this me. This is me. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is me interpreting why this is failing today. Okay. From within a political movement, which is I'm part of, uh -huh. And trying to convince you guys to stay inside of this place and try to theorize stuff rather than just be here yeah. with a sad face. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, this, so this is Daniel. Call. This, yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of Lukaci and purgatory. Yes. Um, so this is the theoretical description. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, what so, you're talking about is a, what in the formal term would be a site, the eventual. Yeah, site. I mean, the. Please, guys, don't take, I mean, Badiou is not a direct theorist, theorist of social fragmentation, contemporary conditions of... No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, my point is, what, what did he do? I mean, in fact, I think that this would be a separate course. Actually, Mike touched on this in the third class when I talked about political economy, because the work we've been doing in our group is to show that uh, Kojin Karatani's theory of social formations is actually profoundly compatible with Badiou's theory. And I know Daniel knows about Kojin Karatani, and I think he wouldn't have a hard time naming this mode C, mode B, and mode A. And Badiou literally claims that the loss of reference is the unknotting of these three things. So if you wanted to develop it, you could very easily, in my opinion, uh, show that there is a intrinsically political way of describing uh, Called Kojin Karatani. Karatani. Yeah, I always, I always felt like this, this display that you have here is a way for us to understand um, this really interesting reference when Beju tries to um, develop um, his rationale for what he calls the idea of communism, um, and he makes a citation which he actually uh, uh, takes the idea from Sylvain Lazarus which is in a letter that Marx wrote to like an American Civil War general that they were friends with, Weidemeyer, where he basically says, actually, the truth of Marxism is not class struggle, but it's around this kind of um, question around the relationship between politics and history. Do you know that whole point there, Gabriel? Because mm -hmm. it, kind of, it kind of reminds me of this last slide that you had there in a certain sense, which is that in the beginning, when we said it's not really class struggle that we're uh, dealing with, and I can send a link to the letter uh, that Badju cites, and it's a kind of interesting textual way that Badju reads Marx there, because I think he really literally uh, finds this citation. Um, he cites it a lot. It's very central mm -hmm. to him. It's a very... It seems like a marginal reference. It seems very marginal, but actually, I I would understand it almost as one of Beju's hooking points for centering the notion of communist idea. And I actually wanted to ask you, Gabriel, given that he has championed the communist idea so much, how would you summarize its significance based on every everything else you presented to us here on Beju's Marxism? Yeah, I think that uh, you know this is one of the things that I think. Uh, it's a bit of his cop out because I, I probably he doesn't know how to do this. He's not interested in it. I think that 
I, I have a lot of sympathy for old non-dogmatic Marxists that are tired and don't want to argue anymore, you know, and I think but there was a bit of that. I think that if you argue with your Marxist friends enough, you will get as tired and you just say, fuck it, okay, I'm not a Marxist, who gives a shit. Uh, we don't need to trust people's remarks on that, but Pardieu is known to have said he's a communist, he doesn't care if he's not a Marxist. That's the secondary thing, not the crucial one. Uh, I do think that he is right in the sense that you will not, and I will try, this is what we call the militant standpoint. My point is that ultimately you will not understand even the analytic tools of Marxism if you don't assume they're constituted from the communist standpoint. They make more sense, they can be evaluated if you adopt that engaged standpoint. If you, if you think that you can assess the critique of political economy, the science of history from a neutral, ahistorical standpoint, it simply will not mean anything. It will be just a bunch of concepts without reference. You won't be able to know how to evaluate what's meaningful and what is not. Right. So I think when in doubt, not to go into weird, detailed discussions of, you know, these concepts, perhaps he's not good at it, he's not interested, I don't know. I think he makes this bold claim. Ultimately, it's useful because he makes, uh, we're, we're going to discuss this later on, but there is actually three concepts when he talks about communism. There's the communist hypothesis, communist idea, and communist experiments. And those are not the same things. Uh, they're useful to show that there is something like the metapolitical, the action, which are something like things that philosophers should probably keep in mind, not to mess up. There's the political, which are non-philosophical claims that are historically situated, right? And there are political experiments, which are not claims at all, they're just attempts at seeing consequences of things that we need to deal with those consequences later, right? And usually it's a big problem to continue to uphold the hypothesis. So to be metapolitically committed to communism after, after an experiment went wrong. So there's a lot to unpack there. I don't wanna to go too much into it now. I just wanted to show that we actually get to this very crucial kind of schema from being an event. This is, let's say, where you get to by meditation 30 something once you introduced Cohen, subject language, forcing and so on. It's just the machinery you need to make this into a rational schema. But it's presupposed in his critique of the crisis of Marxism in 1982 already, right? Uh, what I wanted to do, that's why I asked if you guys still are up for, for going uh, along a bit more, is that I think that with this problem in mind, and something which we didn't have a chance to discuss, but I think it's worth mentioning, which is most authors who bring up the crisis of Marxism, or Andy is asking, is it not crucial that today communist reference is the history of Marxism as such? This is what differentiates but you from post-Marxists such as Laclau. Yeah, I think that is a really good point. Like, uh, you know, uh, Zizek has a good point, like when he wrote like, First is tragedy, then as far as and other books from that kind of very Badiouian period of his thinking, when he said, Yeah, yeah, communism, but if there are no real problems that require us to go through the problem of the commons, communism is meaningless. I think what he was trying to say is that, yeah, we communism is only you know as valid as the reference we have and what it names in reality. But as a Lacanian, Zizek is prohibited from talking about the using the word reference. So he talked about the real, and as Lacanians, we're also forbidden to talk about the real as a structured thing. So we need to talk about the impacts and the question and the only negative terms for it. So we never get to say something as vulgar and simple as, look, is this doing something out there? We always need to say in this cryptic way, but does it touch the real of whatever? So, but ultimately it's pointing to the same direction. And I think it separates these guys who are trying to revamp the communist uh, hypothesis from the post-Marxists who will, let's say, turn the emptiness of reference into a virtue. Well, if there are no reference, anything goes, all, all resistance is communist resistance, or the, the emptiness itself is the basis for the signifier, right? Or some Walter Benjamin-like thing, which I think is a bit in your question as well, Andy, like, oh, so isn't the past the place where we can all find this kind of shared ghost of communist in the past, isn't that what binds us together? We're all kind of 
you know, in the end of the world, dealing with the loss or something. But you is very uh, anti-Benjaminian in that sense, right? There's nothing in, in the past uh, that we should use to uh, neither ontology nor metaphysics nor science, law, art, nor the past of politics actually can substitute this communist work, right? Under concrete historical conditions. So, uh, yeah. So what I wanted to do, as I said, to, to, to move like the last point is, okay, how do we turn all of this into a discussion of crisis of Marxism becoming constraints or conditions for the project of being an event, right? So this is the classic theory of the generic procedures, right? You have some situation like a singular event and you have artistic procedures, the same thing with love, with science and politics. Right. I want to use this schema here to create a sort of panorama of possible positions. And I think that it can help us to understand why the most <laughs> weirdly conservative, boring one is actually the one that takes the Marxist crisis most seriously and actually answers it with the way it's compatible with Marxism. So it's not the way Badiou does it. You can definitely find it in Badiou in many ways, but I think it's helpful the way that I want to show you that. So the first thing I want to show is that there's something like we could call an infra-philosophical statement in this proposal, which is before we claim that there are law of art, science, and politics as procedures, I'm adding three dots here, because before we claim that, we're simply saying there are multiple forms of thinking. There are singular events in multiple situations. Like perhaps we don't know that there are only four of those. Perhaps there are more. At the first level, that's what I'm calling the architecture of this project. This is what he's stating. There are multiple situations. There's not one situation. In these situations, stuff happens, right? And there are multiple forms of thinking. There's not just one way of evaluating if you're keeping true or developing consequentially what happened or not. You could abide to these things and not abide to the idea that there are four procedures, right? At this, this is the basic infrastructure. You, you need an additional statement to claim well, and these multiple forms of thinking appear in four ways, art, law, science, and politics. It could appear in other ways. So Zizek will say religion is one. I will try to show to you that the religion, at least in a very vague understanding, doesn't really, uh, it's not really cut for it. But uh, I just wanted to make that distinction. And to show that this is an interesting distinction, while art, law, science, and politics, I mean, are attested by engagement, meaning somebody develops artistic sensibility and form, somebody engages in an encounter with a loved one or develops a theory about reality or engages with other people, organizations, so on. These three statements here, we can actually propose a sort of weird, I don't want to call it transcendental deduction, but a weird deduction out of a kind of existential position. So it's just something weird that I, I think it's useful in a strange way, but you never does it, but I think it's interesting. So. Let's say we want to claim that radical novelty is thinkable. If it is thinkable, then it must be possible for thinking to be guided by what is new, meaning novel things can actually inform thinking rather than simply being formed by it, right? We, we, we should be able, if, if novelty, uh, radical novelty can be thinkable, then we can be guided by what's new rather than simply guide novelty back to something we already knew. You see that this is actually very connected to the way that we, we address very quickly, but Sartre, Althusser, and other people will argue that's the problem. Marxism is a new theory, but can it be a theory that's open to new things, or is it a theory of a specific type of novelty we apply everywhere, right? So if we're saying that, no, Marxism makes radical novelty thinkable, then we must be able to distinguish between political thinking being guided by new things being informed by them, transformed by them, or taking those new things and applying them into schemas we already have. In other words, if novelty is thinkable, then ideas are different from ideals. An ideal is putting novelty into a schema we already know. An idea is thinking being guided by something new. I mean, very vulgarly thinking about it makes sense, right? When you have an idea, it puts you to move you do stuff, you might not even be able to tell us why you did what you did. You just have an idea of how to solve a problem, for example, right? Whereas if you have an ideal, you tend to use it as a standard 
to judge and evaluate whatever comes your way, right? It's a kind of preconceived thing. So many people will call Badiou an idealist just because he uses the word idea, but idea is not the same as ideal. And I think idealism is probably be stored for people who have a bit more of faith on ideals than ideas. Anyway, if ideas are distinct from ideals, then two things follow, I think. First, it is impossible for there to be a single idea in time. If only one idea appears, if only once we are guided by what's new, then in a second moment, that idea will serve as the frame for every subsequent novelty, which is a definition of an ideal, right? If, if ideas are not ideals, I know the words are so similar, the argument becomes weird, but if ideals are not, ideas are not ideals, then there cannot be just one idea. Because if there's only one idea, it will become the ideal for everything that comes after it. For example, if the only revolution that is new is the October Revolution, then everything that happens after it, we try to adapt to the October Revolution kind of concepts and schemas and so on. Well, it became an ideal. And therefore, ideas are not that different from ideals. Every idea is just waiting to become someone else's ideal afterwards. Right? So we could say that if ideas exist, then there must be multiple ideas diachronically. If it's not possible to have new novelties, new kind of moments where we're guided by things that are new, if this happens only once, then what functioned as an idea in the first moment will become the ideal for every novelty that comes after it. So if you want to really say that radical novelty is thinkable, you're obliged to say there are multiple ideas in time. Otherwise, you are left with ideals anyway. But it is also impossible to, for there to be a single type of idea in the sense of, for example, there are only political novelties. Otherwise, what function as an idea in one practice would become an ideal for another practice. So for example, well, there are many political ideas. October Revolution is different from the Cuban Revolution is different from the Paris Commune and so on and so forth, but they're only political ideas. So. When it comes to art, we should judge art by politics. When it comes to love, we should judge art and love by politics. When it comes to science, we should judge it by historical materialism and so on. Well, if that's the case, then ideas are not different from ideals again, because what function as ideas in politics becomes ideals for art, ideals for love, ideals for science. So ideas still are not fully distinct from ideals. So if there are ideas and they are distinct from ideals. Multiple ideas must exist synchronically as well. So what is this here is a weird way of showing that it's necessary in the very concept of idea for it to be multiple. If you say that there is an idea, you are obliged to assume that there are multiple ideas in both diachronically or synchronically. So you could deduce this here from simply the idea that radical novelty is thinkable. So you see, the argument for these three claims does not follow from the actual history of art, love, science, politics, or whatnot. You can actually, if you claim that radical novelty is thinkable, a good argument could be made that you have to commit to these things. If you say radical novelty is thinkable only once in the cut of modernity, when Galileo did something, everything that comes after it is now measured against Galileo's act. And Galileo becomes an ideal for everything that comes after. It's like Milner claiming psychoanalysis is good because it's Galilean. Like, okay, it seems like you have an ideal for what psychoanalysis should be like that's coming from very far away, right? So my first level of argument, which is not in Badiou at all, it's a totally crazy deduction I'm proposing, but I think it's charming is to show that we can actually have these three claims without the procedures, the concrete procedures, right? Uh, but we actually go from the sort of infra-philosophical architecture to philosophy proper when we give a bit of content to these multiple forms. Okay, it's not like an abstract argument, but actually there is such a thing as science, as love, as politics, as art, and you can commit to specific things that happen in those fields. And you can take seriously what was thought in each one of those different situations, 
right? So this is the classic image you'll find, but you're repeating many art, law, science, and politics, right? And now with this kind of schema, we can start seeing the ways that uh, it can be distorted one way or another. Uh, I added a quote here by Badiou himself, which I think is interesting, but we're not going to have time to explore it, where he, he talks about how a given philosophy is homogeneous in aspect, where it imitates mathematics, it imitates poetry, imitates love. So it has a bit, it takes over the stylistic of the period it is kind of engaging with. And I think this is relevant for the thing we talked about. But you is very aware that there is a distinction between this infrastructure, right? And the particular content that fills it in and that comes with, let's say, collateral effects. You're, you end up being contaminated by the stylistics of the epoch because not because of a wrong thing or a bad thing, but because of the good fact that you're engaging with real developments. This will kind of stain your writing or your thinking, right? But the more we know this, the easier it is to separate it, which is something we were talking about from the beginning. So if this is the schema for philosophy, we know that this is the schema for anti-philosophy, right? Novelty in many fields are actually evaluated not on their own accord, but by a privilege procedure. So for example, politics is the only procedure that exists. We evaluate art, love, and science from the standpoint of political thinking. It's still an engaged position. There is such a thing as political thinking, but we actually are negating that there are multiple forms of thinking. So we negate philosophy. We think we do philosophy from inside one procedure. It might be a combination of procedures, but generally it's from the inside of one. And we evaluate the others from that position. So we can say that it's a way of negating that there are multiple forms of thinking. Uh, what Badiou calls a sophistic point of view is one that not only negates multiple forms of thinking because it negates thinking at all, but also negates that things happen that require new thinking to, uh, to be addressed. So it's, you could say that it negates these two statements and submits art back to the place it came from. It's just you know, another aspect of the situation is just power struggle or is just, you know, entertainment. Love is just, you know, the interplay of sexuality or whatever. Science is just, you know, technology meant for making money. Politics is just the field of the more, most powerful, whatever. But ultimately, if you look at that infrastructure that we we're talking about, not only are we negating that there are multiple forms of thinking, we're going a bit further and we're negating that there are things that happen in those fields to begin with. Right? In the case of anti-philosophy, we're not negating that things happen in those fields. We're just claiming there's one form of thinking, engaged form of thinking for dealing with it. So this is why he say that he's, he will claim that in many cases, Marxism is always flirting with anti-philosophy in a certain sense. Because one of our big problems is we might accept there are many ideas in political history, but sometimes it's hard to accept there are ideas that are not political. So the third thing, which that's why I think we can answer Zizek a bit, is that we can negate the three statements. And what does it look like when we say that there are not multiple situations, no singular events, and no multiple forms of thinking? Well, we get a theological framework where all situations are expressing a one situation that's behind all of them. Every thinking is expressing the same sort of spiritual thing or same substance in a certain sense, right? You get a more religious kind of feel like all events are one event, all situations are one situation and all different you know, forms of novelty are actually just attesting to the one novelty behind it all that always repeats itself. It goes very well with actual practice, right? Because in a certain sense, it just reintroduces the one at this very general framework, but doesn't really get in the way of doing art or anything like that in some, in some situation. So it's understandable why Zizek would approximate religion to the procedures. But I think that keeping track of these three things here makes it easier to see why it's not the case, right? You don't need ideas if you take this view because every new event, every new thought ultimately refers to the same thing. It, cannot, it might not be an ideal because it's even higher than that, right? But it still has that kind of unified form. So the problem is this then. If we want a general theory of this structure here, 
right? And not even going into the specificities of these things. If a general theory of novelty is possible, one that apply, says that there are multiple situations, singular events can happen and multiple forms of thinking uh, can take place after these novelties, as we saw that the crisis of Marxism requires in a certain sense, we are able to do this. We need to be able to abstract broader structures from context and materials that are quite different from each other, right? Not only different situations, let's say, in the history of politics, but different situations between the political situation and an artistic one. We need to be able to cut across all those very profound differences. At the same time that we make this abstraction, we need to preserve indetermination. As we saw, this is the bigger problem. It actually leads out to Serre to claim, if I can find this weird quote here, that the only thing that we can do is to draw up formal conditions if we want this theory. We cannot have a quantum because we need practice to inform what we're doing. So the only thing that is left is for this to be a sort of weirdly indeterminate theory. It's a determinate theory about indeterminate things. That's a weird thing, right? Uh, thirdly, uh, we need to be able to affirm uh, the, the idea that, that there are means within these situations that are different here to practically and theoretically respond to this indetermination and contingency. So not only are we saying that there are multiple fields like this and saying that we cannot anticipate what happens inside of them, we're also claiming that whatever happens inside of them, those fields themselves can answer to that novelty. They don't need philosophy to answer, right? If we go back to this drawing, this is precisely this per pink arrow here, right? It's not enough to say that something new happens that breaks with what we are able to discern. We're also claiming that whatever new happens can be modeled, can be represented or developed, or that difference can be made uh, uh, to circulate or to become effective from within the situation itself. Not only that, but we need to be able to revise this theory itself based on what happens in this new situated development. So it might be the case that something new happens here that requires us to revise even the framework we're working on now. So it's a very big challenge that the theory of the, you know, the practice, how does Alistair call it? The, the, the practice of the theory of theoretical practice everywhere, whatever, some weird combination of those terms that he proposes, it's a, it actually needs to live up to very complicated constraints, right? You need to be abstract enough to do more than what Althusser wanted and Sartre wanted, even though both of them were aware. I mean, everyone at, uh, in some level in Marxism, the 20th century is aware that the relation between politics and art, politics and law, politics and science is complicated. And we probably need something that is not a pure reduction of those skills to politics. So, I don't know, in the search of methods, Sartre will talk about Flaubert's life and the, the specificities of his writing and say we shouldn't be able to, we shouldn't want to reduce this to just class analysis, but how to make it compatible with it. Uh, Althusser will have something interesting to say about, uh, even, uh, but you himself will write about the autonomy of the aesthetic process during his Althusserian years. But it's a big challenge, and by you, I think makes it even more complicated by saying that we need to be abstract enough to not say anything, not presuppose anything about all these different fields, right? At the same time, we're not presupposing anything. We're saying that we want to uphold that within them, they have the means to develop their own thinking about what happens inside of them. And we're claiming that we're gonna, this is intelligible enough that philosophy can come afterwards and revise its own presupposition based on what it learns from what these fields themselves learned from what happened inside of them. So it's already very complicated. So not satisfied with this, we already kind of in an exemplified way, we already know that we need to avoid certain categories that we cannot hypothesize or presuppose them as if they are immutable. Because if the 20th century showed something, it showed that these are categories that each of these fields kind of puts into question. 
So for example, uh, this is something, but you will repeat in a couple of places, but it never with this kind of schematism, but I think it's a good example. We can show that art during the 20th century, put into question if, if art is always tied to the structure of the object. Art can be a process that never really objectifies into you know, a thing, a work. So performance art, uh, different types of conceptual art. So suddenly it makes no sense. And I think that you can find this in Heidegger and Nietzsche, perhaps this idea that, well, art showed us that there's something wrong with a metaphysics that takes the being to be an object, right? This is a very classic Heideggerian thing. If art exists, then being is not an object. We cannot generalize the idea of objects because we can actually question them. They're historically determined types of objects, theories of objects. They can actually be practically critiqued by the development of art. Artistic thinking is actually putting that into question. We can actually show, I mean, as Lacan never tires to show, but Freud as well, that if love exists, then what the theory of sexuation in psychoanalysis shows is that we're not born as one body to begin with. We actually need to constitute your body through weird symbolic practices. This is not a given. Well, if there are things that are not, that do not emerge as a unity, as a one, we cannot presuppose that being and the one are the same or are reciprocal as Badiou says. So if psychoanalysis exists or if love exists, then the one is not. We cannot presuppose that the, that the being is always one, right? Well, as we will have also with Wittgenstein, for example, if science exists, then it's not true that being makes sense because science is effective insofar as it has reference and philosophical statements about being have no reference. So there is no connection between being and sense. Being doesn't make sense. So being cannot be object, have the form of objects, can not have unity because of love, cannot make sense because of science. And well, after, communists declare they're gonna totally transform our material existence, meaning material existence is a political category. Being cannot be existence because if you turn being into existence, that means that existence cannot be changed because it is what it is. So you are not allowed, sure, go ahead, create your general theory of novelty, create your ontology, just don't have you in your ontology, the concept of object, the concept of unity, the concept of sense or the concept of existence as a presupposed thing. That's a condition if you want to take seriously that these things actually think and critique these categories, right? If we just want to apply this to what we already know that happened in the 20th century, we already know ontology cannot treat being as an object, as the one, as something which has sense or something that exists. Does this make any sense to you guys? Because I know it's a very weird argument. John is happy. I'm happy if John is happy. Okay, please ask questions if it doesn't make sense. I think that at this point, it's, it might look like we're moving away from, uh, from Marxism, right? Because suddenly the, the problem became so huge Right. Oh, so it's not only let's make room for new reference for Marx, for, for Marxist theory or for communist practice. Suddenly we said, ah, if you're going to make room for, you know, new political movements after 1980, why not make room for the fact that art thinks its own practices, science? So it suddenly it became a huge family we need to accommodate, right? Uh, but you see, the, the spirit of the problem is actually the same spirit of the problem as posed throughout the 20th century as the question of the crisis of Marxism. That's what I meant by saying that it's actually, we're embedding that problem even deeper into our, our framework. St Stephen uh, has a question. So I have a question, Gabriel. So my understanding of Badu was that the conditions of philosophy don't think themselves, that they have a certain practice, and but philosophy ultimately has to come in uh, both to think the practice as it is and to think how they're 
how the concepts internal to the practice are compossible with the other conditions of philosophy. So can you say more about what you mean by that we assume the conditions have the resources internal to them to think themselves? Like, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think that this, I, I would disagree a bit with your reading that point. I think I can point you to, to good kind of resources in Badiou and bibliography, like his own text, where he will claim very explicitly. For example, in the chapter on politics and philosophy from the book Conditions, you will see him explicitly claim. The problem is philosophy cannot accept that politics thinks. You will find in the book on in aesthetics, he will claim explicitly. The problem is that all the paradigms for the relation between philosophy and art is that nobody wants to accept that art thinks. It only thinks if it becomes philosophy afterwards or if, it be, if it's driven by political thing. He will also claim Wittgenstein's problem is that he doesn't accept mathematics thinks. Right? And to a point, his critique of Lacan is also that for him, sexuality is only an impasse for thinking. It's never the cause of thought. So he will also criticize psychoanalysis for not accepting that love is a form of thought. So you will find throughout his work, claim after claim, that conditions do think they're all forms of thought. And that's, a, I mean, this is what I'm trying to convince you guys. Ultimately, this is the weirdest statement and the most hard statement to accept in his, his project. And the weird thing is that we think that we only need him to say in a sort of uh, Lazarus, you know, Sylvain Lazarus, this friend of his who had this book based on this principle. What does it mean to assume that people think? That's the political premise. We, we think Badiou could stop there. But as I tried to show, it's within the very concept of novel thought, the necessity that it, that it be multiple. So you can only solve the crisis of Marxism that has to do with political thinking. And, and finding the resources to affirm that politics can think itself by assuming that other fields can think itself as well. So it all it's a, you need to buy the package as a whole. Yeah, if I could just follow up though, because I get confused because there are a bunch of parts where he's like, well, let's take the question of what is mathematics. Well, that's not a mathematical question, right? It's not a, it's not a question that's treated from within <clears throat> mathematics or the question of what is politics, right? That's obviously not treated within the, in the internal resources of politics. Yes. It's a philosophical but, but Stephen, question. But what, is, what are the answers that Badiou gives to what is mathematics and what is politics? Well, I can't say. <laughs> yeah, because he never poses those questions. No, he does pose the question. No. Rhetorically, he might mention this, like, but what is politics? But it's not part of the system, the answer to that question. Think about it. Like, there are no books by him about what is, like the book, I think a great, a great example, a book called Number and Numbers about, well, should be about philosophy of mathematics, should answer the question, what is a number? The whole book is a reconstruction of the theory of surreal numbers, which is not a philosophical idea, it's a mathematical concept, which is currently the broadest concept of number, operational mathematical concept of number we have. So he, the whole book is on the one hand, deactivating philosophy of mathematics, showing that the philosopher should go towards mathematics to see what mathematicians are doing and showing that mathematicians, if you look at it with a attentive kind of look, we'll see that they are thinking these questions in a much more practical way. Yeah. I mean, I just worry about all those sections where he's like, for example, mathematicians themselves won't recognize that they're the discipline of ontology. Right? He goes on and on about this in, in yeah. being an event. And so, I mean, it does seem that there is something, some sort of thought. It's not just that philosophy comes in and recognizes how all these conditions can be thought simultaneously and consistently. It's somehow that the, it seems at least he thinks, at least in some places that the internal resources of the conditions somehow can't recognize what they are. And yeah, that philosophy think, somehow has. To. I think that's a really important idea. That's really important. I mean, it's not like he, he's weakening philosophy. He's not saying it's useless. 
there is something to be done, right? But for example, I would just remember here that he will claim in the manifesto that philosophy doesn't produce true propositions. True propositions are produced within the procedures, right? So compossibility, I think it's still the main theme. How can I make these things compossible? It's still the guiding question for philosophy. Uh, you know, you experience art, love, science, and politics. Are you able to maintain that all those things are thinking without reducing one to the other, right? Uh, in, within that task, that idea that, well, the point of view of compossibility will make me, uh, let's say, highlight things that from within that practice are not necessarily the useful things or the necessary things or the primordial things. I think that's that's true, right? But it's in, he has a theory of let's say what philosophers are doing, their philosophical work, and so on. But it's definitely different from the theory of what generic procedures are doing, and it's much more an auxiliary thing, which is pretty much let's say it's still a very interesting thing that philosophy does. Uh, uh, it's just not all that, right? Uh, it is, I mean, for people who like Hegel, it is like a weird proposition about what it means for the owl of Minerva to fly at, you know, when it gets dark. It really comes afterwards, right? Uh, it's just that it's not coming afterward in the sense that every reflexive movement of spirit, I mean, this is something I want to talk about when we get to the last class, which is the comparison between the theory of spirit in Hegel and the theory of the procedures in Badiou, but uh, it's just not that you need to pass through philosophy to have a reflexive moment of thinking. This reflexivity is internal to a procedure, right? Uh, artists write about art and they write very differently than philosophers of art. What's meaningful to an artist, how things are meaningful to an artist, like theories and things are very different. The same way that of course, political militants write about politics, write about philosophy, write about whatever. But within the procedure, those things are mobilized in ways that, you know, if you're concerned with the singularity of every uh, procedure, you're going to look at those things very differently, right? Uh, I do think that he overemphasizes, and I wanted to get exactly to this point now, he overemphasizes in being an event, a certain description of what he's doing that I think he regrets having done. And let me just follow up quickly on that. I swear I'll shut up. So the, the uh, one of the things I took from, especially being an event, and maybe this is what you're talking about that he regrets, uh, is that one of the roles of the philosopher is they take certain figures of thinking from one truth procedure and they bring them, they disseminate them in some way to the other truth procedures, right? That some kinds of ideas that are born within a certain condition, their philosophy grasps them and brings them to another truth condition in a way that's productive in some way. It, is this, I mean, this is what I would have called thinking, right? And, and Yeah, no, I don't think that, it, I think that's more Deleuze, like, you know, the sort of transit between science, art, and philosophy, and you can like, because there's a plane of imminence, you can take ideas from one field, bring to the other. I think, but you like this idea of reference, regionalization of, of statements. He is quite aware that some things are only effective in certain domains. And when you remove them from that domain, they are no longer that effective or they become something else. Uh, I, I will try to go more into that into the, in the next meeting because it will be all about the theory of the procedure. So some things I might leave you. Uh, hanging in them and with those questions, Stephen, but we will address them again next time. Uh, definitely very crucial things. I just wanted to make sure I don't miss two, two things. The first is that when we get to this idea here, I presented this general problems, general conditions, and I presented this specific conditions for this general theory, right? Well, the moment that we have this, we have everything we need to claim that the decision to adopt ZFC as the grammar of ontology is a pragmatic decision in the sense that please go and find any discourse in any field that is able to talk about 
any situation in an abstract way indeterminate while affirming that there is some sort of model theoretic reflexivity that doesn't presuppose objects, unity, sense, or existence. It's really fucking crazy that ZFC actually fits the bill. Perhaps if you can find another one, it's can fine. You, can, you, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that a uh, little just right there? Can you repeat that phrase? Again? Uh, I'm not sure I can, I can <laughs> make a nicer phrase, but the, the general point is this per pink stuff I added here. You see, we deduced all of them from the starting from the crisis of Marxism. We saw that this implies that political thinking must be able to think itself. But if radical novelty exists, it actually implies that there are multiple thoughts. If we want to have a general theory of this, we, are, we need to commit to these ideas. It must be an abstract theory that abstracts away from very different contexts and materials without presupposing them. It needs to preserve indetermination because we are trying to affirm that new things can happen, so we cannot claim what they are. But it must also claim that whatever novelties appear, these different situations might have the resources to deal with this novelty and think through this novelty reflexively, and that this might affect our general theory itself. We might need revision. We're not claiming to be sure that we will not be surprised by what comes about, right? New mathematics that turns everything around, no longer set theories, there's something better. It might happen. And I try to exemplify this more concretely by showing that the 20th century, we can claim very concretely that if art is a form of thought, if in the development of works of art, conceptual art, performance art, it makes sense, or even poetry makes sense, then being cannot be object, you have the form of an object, which is a claim that we already find in philosophies that are very attuned to the art world. They already like, make the distinction between being and beings, for example, right? Uh, the same is valid for love, for science and politics. So this becomes conditions that we need to abide to if we're saying that this general theory is possible, right? So this is a very different way of posing the, the question of the beginning of being an event. We're saying, what is the discourse that abides to these four conditions? And does not presuppose that there are objects, there, are, there is unity, there is sense, or that its structures exist. Well, you, we can check that Zermelo Frankel's axiomatic system actually lives up to all these conditions. Does that mean it's the only one? It's God given, its rightful meaning is to be by the use ontology? No, it can be totally contingent. It might be just you know, by chance that this is the case. And we might actually find other candidates. It's only the fact that whatever candidates we have, well, we need them to live up to all of these conditions. And what I find this, we, we arrive now at the, the last slide. So we, you guys can go to sleep very, very in a bit. Which, what I find amazing, uh, yeah, this is why Stephen is asking, yes, this is why ultimately, Fundamental ontology. First, there is not a fundamental ontology because we're not talking about the underlying being of everything, right? I mean, we're not making a positive claim about what everything is. On the contrary, we're trying to have the most general theory about how situations can think themselves. We're not trying to have the most general theory about what everything is. Uh, that's why it doesn't make sense to say we, we should have the same hope when we move from formal to natural science because it's the opposite hope. One is formal. Being abstract is protecting singularity and practice. The more abstract we are, the more we're leaving to militants to fill in. The other is actually giving positive content, filling in with positive content. So being formal is not the opposite of siding with militants because it's too abstract. It's on the contrary, that's how you trust militancy to be able to reflexively think its own situation. So mathematics is actually, in this sense, aiding, right? The, it's something Althusser had an idea of, like it's allowing us to treat the formal conditions of practices thinking themselves without presupposing too much about how this happened. 
Well, it happens because the mind is processing information through models and is revising its, its biases and so on. Well, that's saying a lot, you know? We don't want to say that much. We want to say it less. It's weaker. That's the weird thing. So the, what, what, I just wanted to close off with a very nice anecdote. Reza was there uh, with me when this happened. We saw it. Uh, in, 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 we were there when this happened. There was a Congress in Prague uh, about Badiou's new book, Immanence of Truth. And it was all about infinity and mathematics. So a lot of really cool commentators of his work were talking about Badiou's work in mathematics and ontology and so on. And if you look at the, the schedule, the program of the conference, you, it's online, you can find it. 90% of the papers are about mathematics equal ontology. What does this mean? What about mathematics allows it to be ontology? Is it because number is connected to contingency as Mia Su says? Is it because you know, the, the way that being folds upon itself, blah, 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 blah. So you have hundreds of papers like that. And then Badiou was about to speak at the end. And it was a bit of a polemic because he turned to most of his followers, like people who've been translating his work, commenting on it for 30, 20 years. And he said, I regret having said mathematics is ontology because it was never meant to be a transcendental deduction that comes from metaphysics, whatever. And this is what he said instead. I translated it here, but you can find the video. It's a really cool video called Five, Five Points. It was published with uh, uh, a very long title, but you can find it online. He doesn't claim it's a failed thesis. He, claims he regrets the way it's proposed. This is how, what he claims. This is from the, the video. He says, he presents like all options you can take. Like it's being one, it's being not one, it's being multiple, it's being not multiple. Like many different options for how you can pose your ontology, right? And he says, it is with regards to this complex philosophical heritage concerning what ontology could be, that using my own vision of the contemporary state of the different conditions, I decided on my own orientation. Note that choice is nothing but a metaphor here. The orientation imposes itself onto a philosopher. It is not chosen in a carefree way. And it imposes itself due to my conviction coming from politics more than from mathematics that one should uphold the materialist ontology, that is, one that is foreign to all transcendence, which is very economic with regards to the inconsistent concept of matter, which names nothing but the hidden and impossible one of the evident multiplicity of all there is. So we need, because of politics, an ontology that claims that there are many things and not one. And many, every one of those many things is many as well. Uh, and so, just like the young Marx, I turn to the affirmation that being is nothing but pure multiplicity without one and without specific attributes, be those material or spiritual. This is the crucial point. I was looking at specific people in the audience. It is only from the interiority of such a movement of thought, so the conditions that he was trying to uphold simultaneously, he talks about all of that uh, in this lecture, it's only from the interiority of this movement that I then arrived at the mathematical condition to see if there was a way to structure as rigorously as possible my speculative decision. So the decision, there are conditions, then there is a decision, then you go looking for your rigorous discourse. And that is what I found in set theory because I, I interpreted set theory in special ZFC as a systematic study of all possible forms of multiplicity. Right, so the order of the phenomena is actually, he has personal commitments to singular status of multiple procedures. He's engaged with art, with politics. He's, you know, a French person loving other people around the world. He is writing books and so on, operas or whatever. He's claiming that all those things are forms of thought. This leads him to formulate constraints on any possible future ontology, which are, are those infrastructural points we made. If these things are real, this militant commitment, then there must be multiple forms of thinking, multiple things can happen, and there are multiple situations. This leads him to formulate a solution. Well, it cannot be an ontology of the object, of sense, of the one, of existence, right? It must be abstract. We can solve Althusser's riddle, right? It's under this 
whole procedure that we then pragmatically arrive at whatever he found in being an event as a possible solution to that thing. With the surprising bonus, and he, he claims that he only decided for ZFC once he found this out, which is Cohen's result, which is compatible with set theory and allows us to demonstrate that it is coherent with such an ontological point of view, that there are procedures which can model their own situations, right? I mean, the, the theory of the event is practically meaningless in being an event. It adds almost nothing. The really cool stuff is in the theory of the generic procedures, in the theory of forcing. How is it possible that a situation can, using only its own resources, come to expand itself and model its own kind of totality through one of its parts, right? Immanently. And this doesn't, it's not from this that you get to the personal commitments. You start from those commitments to arrive here. The reason why I made this little thing is that it reminds me a lot of capital, you know? This part here is usually, the value theory is usually, you know, treated as this theoretical first chapter you can never get out of pretty much like the thesis mathematics is ontology. And then at the end of the book, you arrive at the history of how value is produced as a universal category in capitalism, right? Uh, yeah, I know that he, he grants them to be true. I mean, because he's not, that's not what he's claiming. Right? I mean, I think that's the whole point if you continue with the, with the video. Uh, as he says, the decision is not based on equating the two things in abstract. If you do equate there, it's wrong. Therefore, the refutations are true. But as he says in that slide I showed, which comes from the same lecture, right? The decision is only from the interiority of such a movement that you can arrive at the rationale behind that decision. And it's amazing because then he turned to, uh, to most of his disciples who are interested in science and philosophy of science says, well, you guys should be more involved in politics. Most of my stuff would be much more meaningful and clear if you were trying to just uphold all these different conditions at once. So this is pretty much where I wanted to get to with you guys. Like a lot more follows from the theory of conditions than it looks like. And a lot of the theory of conditions follows from the crisis of Marxism being taken seriously. That's like my big motto for today. Like we're gonna get to the question I didn't address today, which is why four procedures? Uh, next time, I'm gonna try to, to uh, let me just see if I can stop screen share. Uh, I know it was very long, guys. I imagine you guys are very tired, but I wonder if anyone has any other questions we can... I think Andy, did, did Andy already have his question answered? Good question. Um, I don't know if it's relevant any, anymore, but I was just thinking about um, the relationship between forcing. You mentioned it a second ago, the, the notion of forcing. Um, in relationship to the uh, like uh, distinction between the different uh, truth procedures or the or the different categories of truth, um, but I, I don't I don't know if I really have a, a question anymore. I'm just curious about it in relation to um, the the. Um, the, there was the slide about uh, where it was describing anti-philosophy and the like ascribing uh, like say a political thought onto an artistic or a scientific or, or a amorous relationship. Would that be an example of, of the forcing of a thought or, or am I wrong about that? No, I, I think that, I mean, very schematically forcing is let's say a formal operation that shows that it is thinkable to assuming an infinite situation, not adding anything from the outside, simply by working with, let's say, being very vulgar, like just by reorganizing things you already have, you can produce a subset which was not part of the original situation. So you know that question of where, how can novelty come 
if I have some, you know, set of things, do I need something to come from the outside, to come from, you know, otherworldly interruption? No, the whole theory of the generics to show it is thinkable that I can produce out of an infinite set, a new subset, which is not included in that already infinite space. So the forcing is the name of the very complicated technique that goes along with this filtering or reorganizing process that allows you then to name that subset and connect it back to names of other parts of the situation. So it's internally, in, totally internal to the to a singular procedure. Is actually a singular procedure that is yeah. like within like a particular like in truth procedure of politics. It would be yeah contained within it. And and he talks about the I mean in the graph of the um, the the four step steps of the procedure the forcing forcing comes towards the end and it's linked to the question of the good um and so it implies that there is like a relationship um within a truth procedure that that while it is part of you know the, the necessary part of the procedure it leads to the question of good and evil or or you know the disaster of philosophy, as he calls it. Um, I'm mostly just trying to clarify for myself by saying some of this stuff. Yeah. But uh, I, I was thinking about it in relationship to the really the question was about whether it related to the independence of the different procedures, and you really answered that. So yeah, no. So I just, let me just add something there. Which I mean, we're, the last meeting, my idea is to to go more in depth into the comparison of the generic procedures. What that's what's going on there and what Marx called the generic. So we're gonna cover some of that ground. But one thing that I find very useful, it took me a while to arrive at this. I wonder if you guys think it's useful as well. It's a distinction that I think helps to see, I mean, is Badiou claiming then that you know, art should stay in its own corner, philosophy, uh, politics in its own corner. These things have nothing to do with each other. It should mix together. Like that makes no sense like in reality, right? Uh, people are chanting in protests, that's already a mixture of music and politics. So what's but you doing? So I think there's a very simple distinction that really helps to clarify how you can think compossibility as this way of mixing autonomy and very, very strong mixture while keeping the two things separate, which is the distinction between doing and using. For example, think about the international, the song by Eugene Potier, the, the anthem, right? He composed it as a piece of music. So you can analyze it compositionally, structurally, harmonically, or whatever, right? And you can think about it as how does it answer to the harmonic strategies of composers in the 19th century? Is it repeating old procedures? Is it doing new things, right? What is it doing artistically? But you can also ask if it has political uses. It's not true that when you sing the international, you're worried like in, a, in the Paris Commune, when they were singing, it's not about being in tune. It's not necessarily about revolutionizing you no know, musical harmony. You're not doing art, you're using art. But you can tell the difference there because the consequences you wanna evaluate them politically. For example, the American anthem is kind of shitty for politics. People cannot sing it. Like the, the distinction between the lowest and the highest notes is like huge. It's meant for singers to sing, right? Like, because we've we've never had a proletarian class in our in American history. This is the reason why. Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. It's, I'm <laughs> well, actually, yeah, yeah. there is a lot of truth to that. There's an entire yeah. it's the, it's the with school the of Houston that argues that there there is a bit. I mean, there's a reason why Marx uh, uh, used the notion of the ensemble uh, of the social relation. They called the social relation or the social link an ensemble. I always like that point. Yeah, yeah, I love Whitney Houston, by the way, Stephen, don't worry. Uh, but you see my point, like we can analyze it artistically and probably it's very interesting that you have such a, you need such a vocal range to sing it, it can connect it to other musical works and make comparison, make new musical ideas intelligible. But that's not the same as evaluating it politically in a political context. So using and doing I think it's a good distinction. For example, you can use mathematics in many ways. Like you can use math like science for 
bringing people together. That means that you're proving new theorems, doing new experiments, advancing science. No, you're using it. So I think from the standpoint of use, you empirically find many times that we're using many fields in order to do something within one field. And when you try to evaluate what you're doing politically by forgetting politics and evaluating it aesthetically, scientifically, it's kind of a cop-out because you're interested in political consequences, right? So there's nothing in Badiou's system that is like prohibiting people from using material from anywhere in any form. It's definitely not about that what we're saying. What is hard is that we don't have the means to evaluate political effectivity, artistical effectivity in an imminent way. We usually re 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 uh, go back to ideals in order to do this, rather than construct our reference and our reference points and our measures imminently from within the situations themselves. So we might be, for example, disenchanted with the fact that, you know, political protest people in Brazil today, they're not really, you know, siding with leftist images. They are really skeptic about the left. That means that in, under no political criteria is it interesting what they're doing or there are no political consequences. There might be, but you need to go very close to people, learn how they think, assume that there is thought in real politics more than in books, right? So it's less about prohibiting people from using materials from everywhere and more about adding to our toolkit the capacity to imminently evaluate what people are thinking on their own terms which is a very militant kind of militant adjacent kind of problem for philosophy, right? So I think that that distinction is more useful to think about these cross references between procedures. Like, of course, politics should probably use in the world we live in all sorts of aesthetic, uh, effective relational amorous or scientific tools we have. The tasks at hand are very, very challenging like climate change and whatnot. So you should be using all of this, but we can explain also why while we're doing this, we're not proving any theorems. We're not coming up with any experiments. And when you wanna do those things, when you wanna do scientific experiments, you might be using political ideas like gender equality to avoid you know, ridiculous uh, uh, male-centered kind of research funding strategies and things like those, which actually keep science from doing proper science. But are you doing politics in the sense of renewing political ideas simply through science? No, it remains irreducible one thing to the other. So it's very practical in the end of the day. That's why I said it has a weird Wittgenstein pragmatic kind of feel with no of the you know positivist, aristocratic, why not feel to it. Simply saying like, if you go back to reference, if you assume that people think, and if you assume that there are multiple forms of thinking, you can actually navigate these differences and actually find ways to evaluate more imminently what different practices are doing or left or missing out on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so just to conclude, Andy, like forcing is a technical term that he uses in being an event to demonstrate that it is thinkable that a situation can have resources to think its own novelties. So it's an intra-procedural idea. And this distinction that I'm proposing between using and doing, I think it's more relevant for how these things interrelate, right? Because of course, in reality, they connect in many ways. But when we, when we talk about procedures next time, we will address this critique like, oh, if he says there are artistic situations, scientific situations, does this mean that, you know, reality is already split into these things separately? Of course not. Reality is a big, crazy mess. But that's not what he's trying to explain, right? So uh, we'll get to th that other question as well. I think John had, had a question. I think we'll, yeah, we'll close here with the last uh, one. Okay, thank you. I'll make quick. So the, um, I'm just trying to understand, I know we kind of said that mathematics is ontology. It was kind of a pragmatic decision of his. So he doesn't necessarily have like a hierarchy of particular subjects that kind of fit the throne of the ontology um okay 
does he, he he also kind of compliments mathematics though for being like the sole subject that has like perfect transmissibility in teaching um and i guess i guess i'm just trying to understand like um I, I don't know, maybe I'm just digging into that evaluation of mathematics more. I also feel like, um, like I teach dance to kids and uh, I don't know, I feel like his, the way he talks about dance in his handbook of anesthetics is just like a really interesting role. Um, I don't know what I'm reaching for yet. I'm sorry, it's not exactly a question. I don't know if you have any opinions on what I'm just saying right now. Um, well, I'm, I'm actually quite interested in, in what you think of his theory of dance because you know he has a very weird statement where he says not dance yet. is not an art form. Yeah, it says that art's always possible. And I just think like it has like a kind of enigmatic formulation compared to the rest of his thought. I don't really get where it fits in. But it's yeah, I, it might not. It might not fit. I don't know. Hopefully you can prove him wrong. Why not? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we'll get to this. Uh, I mean, today I tried just to bring mathematics in. I mean, you see, like ultimately we didn't even address like Gironi and Johnson, right? Hopefully, from everything we saw after that, it should be a bit clearer that there are kind of weird expectations as to what science should be doing for Badiou, and it's simply not doing those things. It's not meant to do those things, right? Uh, so the idea that if, because he's using mathematics, he's talking about the whole of reality that makes no sense. He's not trying to ground politics in science or anything like that. Uh, we can go more into, in detail about this next time, but uh, this thing about transmissibility of mathematics, it is something that, I mean, he, he goes back to this theme many times because of Lacan, who had this claim that, you know, our ideal is mathematical transmissibility. Uh, it's a complicated topic. Why does psychoanalysis need to rely on mathematics in any way? It's very interesting, intricate problem within the history of psychoanalysis. Daniel Tutt and I, in fact, we, Daniel and I, we, we discussed this actually a couple of weeks ago when we were doing this uh, uh, event on Jean-Claude Vilner's book, where mathematics and psychoanalysis is one of the main topics. But uh, I think that when Badiou mentions this, you know, it's totally transmissible. Uh, it's always in the context of Lacan. Like, like it, I don't see this having, um, I think the claim that he likes the most, the not Lacan's claim, is a claim that he makes in the second manifesto for philosophy, where it says the good thing about a theorem is that even though uh, it doesn't tolerate, I mean, what, what, what is it like? The good the thing about mathematics is that it doesn't address anyone in particular, but then it doesn't exclude anyone as well. Uh, it's a, a weird formulation about. Uh, universality and so on, but I, all of those things seem a bit auxiliary. Like, uh, don't don't seem like play very strong function in the system. Like, what does the transmissibility of mathematics do in Badiou's system? Not much. Like, this is the whole point, I, I guess. Like, you won't be able to find a condition that uh, saves you from doing the work inside. The other conditions in the end of the day like no science doesn't cannot save politics from itself or you know love cannot save politics from itself and in, in all the senses so the theory of compossibility the theory of you know you need to uphold all these conditions at once is bringing us back to the first point i made it has this weird double sense of i know daniel wants me to conclude so concluding uh it has this double sense of it's saying one thing cannot save you from the imminent problems of another, but precisely because it cannot save you from them, it brings you back to open problems we haven't solved yet. So that's actually how you get to meet again the current problems of Marxism. Like first, letting go of certain detours that don't really solve them. Those problems just kind of block them from being properly posed. That's why I mentioned that I think that it connects very nicely to contemporary challenges, which currently are you know, we try to solve them through science or philosophy very often. So technological advancement, scientific advancement, those things will, you know, like accelerationism, like techno technology will pretty much, will solve the communist problem without having to talk to poor people, that sort of thing, you know? Uh, or we don't need to solve this problem because being itself is the common. So again, philosophy solved it for us. It, 
I think, mm. but this point is no, mm. you know, we're gonna have to solve it politically. There's no my, my, my question would be is, is a Marxism as it pertains to the four conditions, um, uh, obviously, the condition of politics is its most uh, central uh, node uh, that, it, that that Marxism is, is living within, is housed within. And then within that, yes, you have the proposition of a communist idea, but you also have the proposition that what is going on in terms of novelty, in terms of the idea, is a mutation over over time of the idea of equality. So politics is fundamentally about equality. And of course, all of these Western Marxists, including Lacerdo, in his book on Western Marxism, critiques Bedjou for talking about justice and equality and bourgeois concepts, right? um, which is interesting, right? Uh, but my question, Gabriel, would be sort of, yeah, but Marxism maybe needs more than just politics. And that's the message that I'm getting from you, which is it's not it's actually not just like is that, is that fair to say for you, right? I mean, is that kind of what you're- I think that after, after what Andy, the question that Andy raised, we can be more precise and say, there is a small difference between absorbing science and psychoanalysis and art into Marxism, which would be like a full-fledged dialectical materialist grounding of all experience and being able to use what happens in other fields inside of Marxism. Those are not the same things, right? Claiming that when we do science, we're doing Marxism or doing politics, oh, which right. is something that right. I think but you would be against, and I think for good reason. Uh, but, then, but then Marxism is, yeah, then good. But then Mar we're, not making, we're not making that claim that it's reducible or sutra to politics, nor are we saying that uh, we need a hodgepodge of all of it and call, it, call that Marxism. We're not saying either thing. Right. In a way, it's it's more than just politics and it's not all of that. What, why it's is not a theory. It's not a theory of everything. But how does the four uh, procedures actually inform Marxism would be my yeah, question. This is my point. I mean, I think but you claim is that it's just politics. It's not more than politics. But politics is yeah. a lot of stuff. Yeah. OK. 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 You know, this is the hard thing. Like, this is yeah. the, this is the big problem. We're gonna. I mean, we're just yeah. spoiling the next classes. This is the big yeah. problem of the third meeting. Like, yeah. Can you uphold? Can you? Can you reconstruct the critique of political economy from a political standpoint, or do you need to talk about Bachelard and scientific methodology to be able to maintain that it's legitimate? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty much the big issue. Like. Can you assume you're using whatever tools in your tool belt, mm -hmm. be them scientific, whatever, but ultimately this is a political endeavor to be measured politically mm -hmm. to the point that if political economy from capital cannot do anything organizationally anymore, we should do something about that, mm -hmm. right? That's legitimate enough reasons to change things around. Uh, or is it, you know, dependent on, like it's a science or, or some sort. I think that, but do you take such a strong position that Marxism is a part of political thinking, mm. not even the whole of political thinking, that he's ready mm. to simply let go of construct the, of the challenge and say, okay, I don't care if you can reconstruct critical political. It was already done. That already happened. And people mm. already did it politically. That's what Marx did, right? I think that is a beautiful argument about how the value form depends on the communist hypothesis, which I think is a very uncommon argument, but I think it's perfect. Uh, you don't deduce communism from value theory. You deduce value theory from your communist commitments. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, you can take that very far. You can do, I think, even a, a more interesting approach to the categories of capital. If you clear the ground from to take philosophy out, if you bring other tools in, knowing that you're just using them, you're not doing science. And if you know that you're first committed to communist cause, and this is what's driving the construction of the concepts, they become clearer, they don't become more confusing. So that's what we're gonna try to do in a very actually detailed way in our third meeting. Okay. All right. We're very grateful for this, Gabriel. Uh, it's done a really, really Guys, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm keeping you guys from job. sleeping. No, no. Thank you so much. We're almost at three hours. If oh, we it was a pleasure.
if we continued longer, we'd be at three hours. So let's close now. And uh, yeah, have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much for coming. It was excellent. We'll see you Bye. in one week. All the best.